Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media and virtual production. Second hour is usually something we want to spend a little more time on. Today, we're going to talk about Africa <laughs> and, and, and uh, my escapades and some other friends' escapades in Africa. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be showing a little bit of that and uh, some slides. The slide deck got much bigger this morning. Uh, Ryan sent me a bunch of photos that I haven't seen before. So um, should be should be a lot of fun, and uh, I should have a friend joining here so shortly uh, to uh, to talk a little bit about it and answer your questions. So uh, stay tuned for that. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Mitchell, what do we have? Thank you, Alex. Our first one in from Roy Myers in Bel Air, Maryland. I shot a video of local band this weekend and sent them the YouTube link. Now they want me to help produce their promotional video. Never done this before. How should I price it? And what's the community's advice for doing a great job? The price is how much it takes for you to do it and how much, you know, there's, there is a, the math is really you calculate what it costs you to get it done. Um, you also calculate the opportunity, uh, opportun you know, the opportunities that you want to get out of that. So if you're doing a show, in my opinion, if you're doing a show once for somebody, you're not going to get into this business. Um, and there <clears throat> depends on how well you know them and how important the band is to you. Uh, then you charge what it costs to do it, <laughs> you know, and then some. Uh, if you, but if you know, if, if this is your first chance to get into something with a band, and this is something you think you want to do, you may give them some discounts, um, you know, to 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 make sure that it works for them. Um, what you really want to do is make sure that you're resourced correctly to get it done, you know. So, uh, you know, especially on your very first one, and you haven't done it before. Um, you know, I would chart, I would tend to charge less, but make sure that I cover the costs of the cameras and the you know, all the, the mics and anything else that you're going to do, you know, that's where you want to, in your very first job, where you want to put your money is resources. <laughs> you know, so um, you're going to, you're, you're going to lose money on time because you haven't done it before. And that's, that's the reality of it. Um, but, but you want to think about um, how to make sure that you have the tools that you need to capture uh, great content. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, that, that is good advice and you should take it. And the other thing is if you're, if you're thinking of getting into that business, Keep track of the time you spend for everything so that when it's all said and done, you can go back and say, well, I, I did okay on us because just because it's you and maybe a few friends shooting it, um, it still costs time for somebody and there's still money associated with it. And as you develop uh, your systems and your best practices, you'll have a better feel for it. I mean, a lot of times when I get a client comes in and says, uh, we got this script and um, how much will it cost to produce it? And I go... Oh, about, about this much. And uh, the, the point of that is that it could be anything. Uh, you just have to justify the price. And if they, if they insist and they keep pushing, I go $2,000 a produced minute for the average project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and again, you just have to decide whether this is something you're getting into or whether it's something you're doing as a favor or whether it's something that you're doing as a business. And those all have very different math, uh, mostly applied to your time. You know, because, you know, that's the, what people do get into is they... Um, they will under-resource the rest of the show to pay for their time um, on a limited budget. The band probably has a very limited budget if they're working with you. And so they go, well, I got to make some money on this and I got to do this thing. So I'm not going to get the cameras I needed. I'm not going to get, and what you end up with is a band that's not happy, um, product that's not going to get you any more work and maybe a check. <laughs> so, so that's a, that's a really, you know, especially when you're getting started, that's a really hard, hard way to, to progress, uh, Courtney. But it really depends on what kind of a concept they have. I mean, music videos, I've worked on some that are really low budget, you know, 30000 you know, ten to $10,000 or so, up to ones that are $1.2 million, right. all for one song. So it depends on their concept and how creative they're going to be. I mean, it could require custom costumes, shooting in multiple locations where you might have to procure permits. And if you haven't produced something like this before, uh, you may find that uh, it could cost you a lot more than you estimated if you've just been shooting stuff like the band on a stage. So take that into account. If it's something simple like just shooting a performance on stage from multiple angles, that's one thing. But uh, Music videos can get really creative and involve playback in multiple locations and costumes and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, and you know you can do that. I, mean, I know that one of the um, big launch vehicles for a band called Live um, back in the early '90s was that they got a friend to shoot the video and they spent five thousand dollars on it. And the head of MTV just kept on playing it over and over and over again. It's going. They only spent five thousand dollars on this music video. <laughs> 
<laughs> it got a lot of play. Uh, Operation Spirit uh, was was a really um, popular one because of that, because they just went out with some cameras and shot a concept. Uh, one thing to think about is if you have control over that, if the band has control over the concept, you're probably in trouble. You know, so that's, uh, you know, they're, they're going to think of things, they're going to watch a bunch of music videos and think of the, and have an appetite for something that you can't make. Um, if you can work with them on a concept, one of the things to think about is, is really, uh, you want to think inside of your resources. You know, it's not so much that you're so conservative that it's a boring video, but think about what can I do and what can I, you know, who can I borrow from and who can I, you know, how can I make this work? And so you, you, you can oftentimes find efficiencies, you know, there's a house that you can use, there's some, there's a location that you can use, there's some friends that have things and you can kind of pull those things together and find a way to do it efficiently without it um, breaking the bank, you know? And so those are other things to think about as you go through that. Again, if, if it's something that you really care about. Um, and so that's the thing you wanna, and I've definitely, you know, everything that got me a new line of work usually started with me scrapping together and trying to figure it out without any, without any resources. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, one of the, the tough ones, and Alex just touched on it, is meeting your client's expectations. You know, they have in their mind, oh, you know, MTV or the latest and greatest uh, YouTube video. Um, it's probably a good idea to sit down with them and show them different examples of movie or uh, videos that have been done for other bands and say, well, this one, this one cost 50, this one cost a million five, this one cost 5,000. So it's a good, it's good to, if you have a reference point that you can both point to and say, this is what you should get. And definitely use up this community. Uh, a lot of us have done things like this before. Um, so, you know, there's lots of things where you go, oh, I'll do this one thing. And we'll say, hey, you know, if you turn the camera like, you know, 20 degrees this way, it'll cost like $10,000 less. So, so, you know, so the, you know, we can give you like lots of little tips and we're happy to answer those questions. So definitely use us up in both uh, office hours and after hours and, and brainstorm with us. Cause again, there's a lot of folks here that have shot a lot of videos for bands and other things. And, and we're happy to help. Um, next question. Todd Worley from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'd like to cobble together a small kit to send out re to remote guests. Webcam, mic, interface, perhaps a single light. Recommendations? Good guy. Yeah, it really depends on what you want to do with the products to come back or if you want them to keep them. So we can go all the way down to like our basic, you know, pile headset with a Sabrent, a USB adapter. So then you got your 3.5 to USB in. You've got... Um, lighting to get through next, which would be maybe a, a small rig. There's this one called the L10. It's like 60 bucks, a little panel light or some, something similar, like the, the little apertures. And then there's, um, you know, a camera. I think we settled on like the video 360 or, or a Brio, just something that'll get you up uh, higher res than what might be like in an Apple laptop. And when I was at Infocom, uh, I ran across this group called Remote Control Studios. And if you want to just have somebody else handle it all and just don't worry about shipping, because that's the other thing you got to worry about, you know, am I going to really run down to the UPS store and go get this, this stuff shipped out? These guys just handle all that stuff. So I'll put a link and I believe we had a second hour guest as well that says the same thing, but they've got an A, a kit, a B kit. You can see here, it's, you know, a nice Sony, uh, small uh, mirrorless camera, a couple little lights, road shotgun. So you could either piece together something like this yourself or just... Go ahead and give these guys a ring and I'll put a, a link again in the chat. Yeah, we, we send a lot of these out and our kits, the budget for our kits would kind of run, range from a couple hundred dollars to about 20 grand. And, and so it just depends on the big ones have teleprompters and, and 6K cameras and big lights and uh, mix pre's and all kinds of other things. And the little ones, the, the most basic thing that we send out, I don't know what you're going to do. I'm going to send you an MV7. <laughs> like here's an MV7 uh, and um, I hope to get it back. <laughs> but the, the reason we use those instead of using interface, audio interface is just because the audio interface was something I couldn't control and it was hard to explain to people what they were doing. The MV7 it seems to work pretty well every single time. The, um, uh, the light that we send that tend to send out as the six C's, um, for the small kits. So the, Pavo, the, the, the Nan light Pavo tube six C's or the Luma pads. Those are the two that we tend to send out to folks. Um, we used to send out auto in ears, but we're now moving towards sending out these little Linsole, um, you know, KZ what tens or whatever that they go in because they just sound so much better and people don't keep on saying, I can't hear you. I can't hear what's going on. They, they definitely can hear, <laughs> hear you when you put those on um, for the for the in-ears. Um, and then 
occasionally we are sending out uh, you know ethernet cables like we ask them like where they're like oh the router's too far away i'm like how far away is too far and they'll be like oh it's 75 feet no we'll just put one in the bag. We'll put one in the in the bag so you know and 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 they you know they're kind of surprised because people just think that 75 feet or 100 feet is not it's just in a, you know so far away and uh, it really improves their quality so um so those are you know and and again those can you can keep on just stacking up until you're sending them you know, three 1650 Pelican cases with lights and cameras. And a, we have a brain that we've built that you kind of set down. The The thing I don't like about the all-in-ones that are built, that we don't build, is that um, when you open the box, it really limits where you can put it in the house. <laughs> like, so the box has to sit somewhere. And we just find that we, we tried some of those and they... It's like it now limits you to what table you can put it on and where you can put it and everything else. Also, a lot of time they're lights. Now, those ones, I think that one the guy showed looked like they had separate lights. A lot of them come up with lights that are built into the kit. And so they're very straight on, which I don't like the look. It's very flattening. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so those are the things you want to think about. But I would say the very basic small kit would be, you know, an MV7, some kind of in-ears that'll plug into it some kind of Pavo tube or light panel or light, or light Luma pad, those kinds of things are going to make a big difference in, in what you're doing there. Um, next question. From Darren Cirillo in Dallas, Texas. I've got several Apple TVs and I use Ubiquiti Unify for my security cameras. Is there a way to programmatically turn on a TV and launch the Unify Protect app at a scheduled time each day? Uh, go ahead, Tom. Can you hear us, Tom? Did I lose him? Um, I go ahead, Jason. There are a handful of ways to do this. It depends on which Apple TV you have. I think the problem you're going to run into is the two-factor authentication, but, but I'll answer the question that you asked. Um, you can do this with MDM. You can also do this with automations. Um, and I, I guess the final way would be single app mode, um, which is a little bit more reliable. Uh, not a single time of day, but, you know, if you want to lock it like it's signage, um, that's your solution. I'll put some links in, Makana. And next question. Next question from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. So Bluetooth beacons are out. A QR code sandwich board sign seems passe. Isn't there some way to do proximity-based ads? We need something at the museum to link web pages to the displays. Go ahead, Courtney. Well, you could use RFID tags, which are the little, you can get them either as uh, active or passive, you know, the, the little things like this. You see it at your bank where he says, tap your phone here to gain entry after hours, or uh, use for Apple Pay or Samsung Pay. Most phones have the ability to uh, take in data from an R, uh, passive RFID tag. Uh, so you could use those and put them in the description in front of the museum display and just say, tap your phone here for more information, and it would deliver a web page URL to your phone and call up your browser and take you to that web page. And go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, two or three years ago, it was uh, very intrusive because I used to go into the drugstore and all of a sudden I'd start getting hit with uh, these uh, ads um, or, hey, by the way, use your card for this and that. Um, and it would follow me outside of the store into the parking lot and perhaps a block away. So um, I don't get that so much anymore. So apparently a privacy issue has been engaged for your iPhone or your uh, Android phone being uh, invaded. Yeah, yeah. They, they, well, you can do it by position. So we've done some experimentation with, you know, um, ultra wideband and uh, no we haven't done ultra wideband but with bluetooth le we can get a pretty good sense of where people are and um and that has been around for a while and so from their proximity we're not really doing bluetooth in the sense that we're attaching to their phone but we're keeping track of where they are so that we can again tell an app to give them something we're not sending web pages but really you have an app that's interacting based on their their location um I, you know i think when people download it not like what Mitchell was talking about. When they download the app to go into a museum or a location, they're kind of saying, I want to know more information about those things. Um, and so that is where these kind of things become useful. Um, I think that the technology is still funky. <laughs> like, like, I just want to let you know, like, you will spend most of your, you, you, I use QR codes. <laughs> and I've been doing Bluetooth LE for five years. <laughs> So like, you know, so just, just to give you a sense of, of, of how, uh, how stable that, that platform is, it's a lot of different phones. There's a lot of different people that are using them. The one challenge that you get into is that not Android isn't 
doesn't support QR codes out of the gate. It needs some, you, your app will need to know what to do with it as opposed to the iPhone, which the iPhone, you just point the camera at anything and it will pop immediately into whatever that wants to do. Um, so the Android takes a little bit more of a lift because you just have to, someone, a lot of people do, like I'd say 80, 90% of Android users, but you're just going to have a higher um, like uh, question rate from Android users on how to use it. Um, the, uh, but I, what I will say is that there is a, to get back to your kind of to what you're trying to do, this is a massive future, you know, of being able to have ad data, you know, people pay all this money to put those little things on their ears while they're walking around the museum. And, um, and this is going to be such a big business, you know, like we've, we've seen this for 10 years, like, oh, when, when we start really adding all that data and interaction and AR is right around the corner where you're going to not only know where you are at, but be able to lock things in. So you're looking at King Tut or whatever and and th things are popping off like this is this paint was this and this was this because not only does it know where you're at, but it can now use the LIDAR to figure out exactly what you're looking at and be able to start tracking things into it, you know. And so there's, it's a big business um, and I would highly recommend paying atten close attention to it. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, if you went with AR glasses that you handed out at the museum that would automatically pick up on a QR code that's above the display or something and then start the AR interactivity. It could then pop up, like you say, all the little call outs to different things that you're looking at and overlay them yeah. uh, into your image would be a great deal. That way, people are a little paranoid, I think, about Bluetooth LE because they're afraid that their phone's going to get hacked. And that's the nice thing about um, RFID tags and QR codes is they're passive and they're one unidirectional. That, um, you can't send data back to the RFID tag and have it stored anywhere uh, or the QR code. And and the QR code is just lowest common denominator. I mean, there are a lot of things that the phones can do that if you have a high, a new enough phone, especially a, an Apple new phone, uh, there's a lot of things it can do that that people are starting to play with in location. So for instance, if, if you LiDAR scan your whole museum and then you build hashes for it, you can have a very low resolution model where the, the phone can orient itself. So if it knows where it is with, you know, Bluetooth LE or ultra wideband, ultra wideband, by the way, tells the phone where it is within a foot. So it's, it's really, you know, it's pretty, it's a little ball that, that ultra wideband will get it into. Once it knows that, it only has to search the hash. It doesn't have to search an entire LiDAR library. It just needs to have elements and you point out to it, once it gets those elements, it knows where the phone is in less than a millimeter. It's position and rotation. So now you can sit there and lock things onto it and build things out and so on and so forth. And that's, it's, it's already here. It's just, you don't see it very often yet because it just takes a lot of development to get it up. To, no one's built the tools to make it easy to, to build stuff. But I, I think that there's probably some big companies thinking about it pretty hard. And by so, the way, Alex, the Samsung phone's camera app does recognize QR codes right out of the bag. So oh yeah, yeah. There are a, lar a large number of phones on Android. I said about eighty percent. Eighty percent, I think, is about right. Um, that of Android phones that that recognize it right out. It's just the twenty percent of people, and they're usually not as technologically savvy. So then it becomes like this. Uh, yeah, the flip phone people. Yeah, they're not good. <laughs> exactly. Go ahead, Mitchell. Another application uh, used in museums, slightly different, um, is if you're in a tour bus or a uh, a running tour that travels like. Here we have a Hagley Museum, which is a gunpowder uh, museum for the DuPont Company. Um, we put a GPS uh, device in it with, uh, that would trigger uh, audio playback. I think the device was an Alcorn McBride. And uh, it would lock onto the satellite. And when you got to it in a certain region, like a bubble, like Alex says, it would trigger a certain announcement, which happened to be me, and, um, and it would play. So I know that's quite slightly different application, but it could be possible in your museum. Uh yeah, one of the many business plans that I never got funded was uh, uh, in 2000, I think I wrote a business plan that you should have tours, uh, driving tours based on GPS. But GPS was, you know, I had a GPS, but almost nobody had a GPS at the time. And uh, and I was like, you could drive around and you could design one. You could, you could have people design GPS things where they record them. So as you drive, you know, like you could do a Civil War battlefield tour and it just takes you around and talks, knows that it's going to take you about 80 minutes to get to Fredericksburg or whatever, and just talks to you about it. You know, just it's like an audio book that just tells you all the things about it. And then when you get there, it goes, okay, if you turn to the right, you'll see this. And you turn to the left, you'll see that. And, um, you know, that that kind of thing could be really, really powerful. I'm, I'm surprised 20 years later, we're still not doing that. But anyway, someday. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. There's one other thing to consider if 
people don't even want to use any type of electronic devices. There's something called uh, Audio Spotlight, which is a a uh, holographic audio uh, transmission rate that um, takes uh, sound and creates a spotlight of sound. So you only hear the sound for that mm -hmm. display. It detects when you step in front of it and starts playing the uh, informational audio. But only you, only the people standing directly in front of the display can hear it. Somebody standing at a display right next to you can't hear it. So it's a very super directional audio field. And and for people who are very, very technologically uh adverse there are there are these devices called tour guides and they will walk around the hard part is is that the, a lot of them are programmed they're all programmed differently and some of them are really good and some of them aren't but but they uh, so the, but but they're all you know they, they're they're ranging a lot of times they're they're very useful they're very interactive and they can uh, you know oftentimes get you through those things uh, next question tim mann from melbourne australia recommendations for a low noise usb interface preamp for use with post hire headset training Post hire headset training. Um, well, what I would say is that the lowest noise that, that I've worked with so far are the mixed pre's. And by the way, I got a little email. I'm sure Guy got the email too that they're, they're taking orders again for the mixed pre three, but they're not shipping until October. <laughs> so, so it's uh, so the mixed pre threes are coming back um, in, into into play, but uh, they're still pretty rare. Um, the uh, I realized I could probably sell the one. We have so many of them. I was like, I was like, I don't know. If we use them all. I wonder if we could just sell like half of them for the probably the same price that we bought them. Um, anyway, uh, so but um, but they, uh, uh, yeah. So they're coming back. Um, Zoom also makes some very low uh, um, low noise um, inputs as well. I, but I I haven't been able to test them head to head. Uh, so all I know is that the that the mix pre's are very quiet. Uh, next question. Gilberto from Santa Cruz, Bolivia. Does anyone know if the loop out port on a Blackmagic mini converter boosts the signal out? I'm looking for a way to extend SDI cable maximum range. Go ahead, Courtney. I know it doesn't change the frame rate or do any any changing to it. And whether it reclocks it or not, I don't believe it does. I, I think it'd be best off with the um, good old our good old pal, the MDHX, because the SDI inputs, as you see here, have both... Uh, SDI loop through out, which are reclocked, and uh, additional outputs, which you can either set as a DA so that you have an SDI in, you have four SDI outs, and they're all reclocked and amplified uh, to go out, or you can take an HDMI in and have it come out of all those multiple SDI outputs. So uh, it's much more versatile. It does reclock, and it does uh, even change frame rates and resolutions if you want to as well. Go ahead, Jason. Both directions. Um, the very most recent smallest, um, you know, the 12 G, um, bi-directional claims directly to reclock, um, for what it's worth. But it, honestly, if you really want to extend stuff, don't go with the smallest of the small. It feels like a bad idea. Yeah. I'm almost certain that, that all the loops are reclocked. Yeah. So I, I think that they're, um, we've used these devices to extend now maybe we just had great cable but we've definitely gone hundreds and hundreds of feet by reclocking every 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 so often um to get them where they need to go so um and we've just used either the loop through or a lot of times what we use is the black magic da's and just push one in and then push it out and but so we haven't used the loops as often as the da's um but again we also have a heavy use of decimators for exactly the same thing the biggest thing with decimators is that we that we are careful about is the fact that it can do something more than just pass it through um, and that you can someone has it set and suddenly you can't understand why everything is a different frame rate than when you what what it started with so um, sometimes we want things to be dumb and not be able to do anything other than move the signal around so that we're not adding something to it uh, next question next question in from todd worley in baton rouge louisiana has anyone used the centrance mixer face or portcaster Build quality looks amazing, quiet preamps, et cetera. I'm looking for a small grab-and-go interface recorder. Now go ahead, uh, Courtney. Yeah, I, I looked at this. I have not tried it. It's, um, I don't know if they have a graphic of it here. I can bring it up here. This is what it looks like. Um, it's two inputs, uh, either instrument or um, XLR with 48-volt uh, phantom switchable. The weird thing about it is that the uh, controls are on the bottom down here, the inputs are on the top, and then the mix panel is in the middle here. So you kind of got stuff, you got to work on three sides of it, which is a little bit bizarre, but I guess if you're going with something small, 
uh, you have to deal with that. It doesn't, I'm not sure if it's battery powered or where it gets its power, if it has to have external USB power, if it has to be plugged into something as a USB interface to work as a recorder as well. It'd be nice if it were a standalone recorder without having to be plugged into a phone or something uh, with a USB interface to provide it with power. So I'm not sure how it does that. And it doesn't have any information as to what format it records in. Uh, Zoom, like Alex says, the um, F2, F3 series, I think, is a two-input XLR-based mixer recorder uh, and interface. Uh, might be a little bit cheaper and work a little bit better for you, but I'm not sure. I haven't tried this. It says it has a 65 dB uh, uh, input um, amplitude for those mic preamps, which is pretty good. It's not as good as 75, which is some of the, the higher-end Zoom uh, recorders or the uh, uh, Rodecaster Pro that I'm using. They have been doing this for a very long time. <laughs> like with Centrance. Centrance was the very first uh, mic input that I used to get into the computer uh, when I was doing podcasts and so on and so forth. And they've come a long way. Uh, the Micport Pro also, um, you know, looks like it does not only uh, X, you know, XLR and quarter, just standard quarter inch uh, balance, but also uh, high Z for instruments. And so, so it's a um, it's a pretty slick little interface. Uh, they they are. I, I hope that they're. You know, the prices have gone up from the last time I saw Centrance. Um, so hopefully they, uh, they, they've they used that to buy better better components. Uh, next question. Gilberto, again, from Santa Cruz, Bolivia. Any tips on a 360-degree live stream setup? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I, I, I want to necessarily go into all the different cameras that you could possibly use. Uh, but but I, I think that there are a couple things to think about as you start to, to, to do these is trying to figure out what, who's going to watch it and where they're going to watch it. So um, if you are, uh, if you're, you're, you're going to find that stereo is hard. Start, stereo is just is a hard thing to look at. Um, you know, it's hard to get it right. So, um, so just think about whether you're, you're trying to have, you know, there are a couple different companies that build um, stereo rigs um, that will that will give you both eyes. Um, streaming that becomes challenging because you have to make sure that the frames uh, get back to the to the viewer at exactly the same time. So if you do, you can't have one eye like a frame or two off the other eye, uh, and it will it's painful uh, if you don't get that right. So what has to happen is is you'll end up with, oftentimes you can end up with either trying to match those together or you build them into a. I mean, there's some device, you know, something like YouTube or whatever knows what to do with them if you put them side by side. So you want to keep them together. The hard part you get into is if you if you're trying to do 4K per eye. 4K per eye is really where things get fun to watch. Um, is if 4K per eye is kind of the minimum uh, the, the, to to really look good. I mean, after below that at a 1080p or or or, um, or 2K per eye, it's, it's really it, it gets harder to watch. Um, it's just softer. Um, it's cool for a couple minutes, and then after that, people don't want to watch it anymore. And so you really want that 4K or 4K per eye, um, but that becomes now an 8K wide. You know, it becomes a very big image um, for you to, to to deal with. And so, um, so that that's a challenge. Is from a bandwidth perspective, you usually have to use two encoders because you're doing two 4K streams. Those encoders then need to be um, output locked. And so that's a you so you're really talking about like relatively powerful elementals, um, you know, those types of things to get that 4K per eye out in a way that I would say is stable. I mean, there are cheaper ways to do this, but they're, they're especially if you're doing stereo. Once you go back to mono, it's a pretty straightforward process. There's lots of, pro there's lots of encoders that can do 4K. Um, the thing to think about is the camera doesn't want to move very much. Remember that people's, if their inner ear and their eyes disagree with each other, our lower brain thinks that we're being poisoned and it wants to eject everything out of our body <laughs> so to get to, to, to get rid of whatever what might be making it sick. So that's what we call seasickness, but really that's a, in, that's a discontinuity between the inner ear and the eyes. And so lower frame rates, the lower the frame rate, the more people are susceptible to that. Moving the camera around because the person's not moving, but suddenly the camera's translating will make people um, not, not comfortable really quickly. Um, the primarily the best content you're going to get is between five and 15 feet away. If you're using something that is all in one, like a theta, you're going to get, you're, you'll have minimal um, edging problems. Uh, if you're using something that's actually, uh, it's, it's actually um, blending five or six cameras, four cameras, five cameras, six cameras, whatever that is. Uh, if it's doing those, those, uh, that the blending, you may end up when you get under three feet, 
you may end up getting, starting to see the seams between them. It'll be like a soft seam that sometimes you can control depending on the encode that you're using. So those are things, some of the things to think about when you're doing the live stream. They are really cool. Um, the other thing to just think about is the content. You know, does everyone all the way around, are they conscious that they're on camera? We shot a concert where um, uh, we put a 360 camera right in front of the stage um, and it was great to watch the stage, but when you turned around, there was folks that were having a great time uh, behind the camera and weren't really conscious to the fact that they were right, like literally three feet from a camera having a really good time and some of it may not have been legal. So, so that, you know, so the, so the, um, so the, so I, I think that this is, you know, back before we legalized marijuana. <laughs> so, so anyway, so the, um, and fortunately that was a test stream. It wasn't a, a real stream. So, so, but it made us very conscious to a 180 might be great. So um, just think about those things to protect the content as well. Go ahead, Peter. Well, the one I remember is I tried this earlier this year, as a matter of fact, tying it. And I learned I needed to st stabilizing is important. We uh, put a 360 camera at the top end of a 40 foot mast. Yeah. To, uh, to, yeah, that'll be. to watch a sailing race, to, to yeah. film a sailing race. And um, the viewers got a little seasick. Yeah. We got yeah. lots of complaints about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So those are the kind of things that we thought it would be really funny to put it on a steady cam rig, but that does not doesn't work in case you're wondering. Um, usually what you really want to do is give someone a stationary place. The other thing to think about is eye height. Um, generally, we put people at the height that a person would stand. So the camera is sitting at five, five and a half feet, typically, um, you know, five feet to five to five and a half feet is where your eyes are kind of the average person's eyes are kind of sitting. So we kind of look at that as a as a, as a general height for, for making that work. Um, but you're better off cutting between them. The other thing to think about is audio. Um, using some kind of like a Sennheiser Ambio, um, you know, can get you some surround. Um, and, and that really does help bring you back into the scene. Uh, next question. Kenny Hampton from Greenville, Illinois, wanting to video capture from upper stories of a building and adjacent construction building project, which will span likely 16 months. Recommendations appreciated for time-lapse capture cameras methods with camera likely mounted outdoors. Go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, the first piece of advice I'd give is make sure that is either really well secured um, or, or a cheap camera that you don't mind losing because I had a friend do what I recommended six months ago and uh, the camera was stolen twice. It's probably a low-end uh, Sony Alpha um, the other thing is you, you, you can get a GoPro and uh, there are plenty of apps out there or programming that you can do to it that, that will snap to pictures. The, uh, the wish list that I really would think would be cool is an app that uh, uh, snaps to picture the same time every day, but it's aware of the day, season, uh, and sun position so that when you do the time lapse and you put it all, all together again, um, the sun doesn't shift around and do weird things with shadows. Yeah, and and there are you know there are companies like um, I Beam Systems and so on and so forth that really are built around um, making this uh, this available for construction. And those are hardened cases that are designed to be outside. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, and if you're cheap, you know the Wisecam. Wisecam makes an an outdoor battery powered unit. Uh, you might be able to also power it. I would suggest uh, having something that has uh, if you have access to where the camera is going to be mounted and a Wi-Fi connection within uh, easy reach of that camera, the best thing to do is have one that records locally time-lapse but also uploads to the cloud so that you can check in on it uh, to make sure it's still running and make sure you know, you've got the latest pictures from the latest days, especially if it's going to be up there for 18 months. You should have an alternate source of power to that camera and a battery backup so that if the power goes down temporarily, you won't uh, lose anything by uh, munging your, your recording card uh, if it goes down in the middle of a when it's, when it's taking shots. Um, but look at WISE. It, most of the security type cameras have a, uh, have a method of doing time-lapse photography so, and uploading them to the cloud. So that would be my suggestion. Yeah, and solar is really great <laughs> just to make sure that everything stays uh, where it needs as far as charging the batteries and then having it run, especially if you're only running it during the day because at night there's not much to see, but sometimes people keep it running. Um, also, just keep it, keep track of um, the, the fact that when it rains, it, it will 
the lens will need to be cleaned. <laughs> so, so um, preferably at night um, and very carefully so not to, but almost all of the time lapse that you take will end up being uh, re-stabilized later because you, you, you know, there'll be wind, there'll be all kinds of other things. So, you know, if it's close, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty good um, because it's time lapse. There's not a lot of motion blur. Now, next question. Douglas Carmichael with a question. Uh, in the electronic music compositions I've created, I found myself being able to build a four to eight bar idea or loop easily, but stumped as how to create interesting variations to extend it into a full track. What techniques can be useful? Uh, I don't have a strong answer. I'm still stuck on the four to eight bars. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Well, if you use a uh, sequencer, even in an analog synth, you set up your sequence with a period, you know, a sequence of 10 to 32 notes, something like that, with with uh, some blanks in there to to offer some rhythm of some sort. And you set up an oscillator and you run it through, and then you run it through a filter, and then you can just uh, keep running that same that same loop over and over again uh, from the sequencer, and then just vary the filter to give it uh, variety. You can uh, make you can change the sound consistently by just turning a knob as you as you go through the song, and you can also vary the tempo by changing the the tempo rate of the sequencer uh, on the fly. So you can use that to create a a long. Uh, uh, track for the, an entire song that doesn't get too repetitive, so it keeps it interesting throughout. Uh, yet stays in t in time and in tune with uh, what what's on the other tracks. Next question, Andre Dole in Berlin. After deleting the Rode Connect driver and app on my MacBook Pro M1, I have a weirdly named remaining audio device in Unity. And now my Bluetooth headphones have disturbed the sound. Suggestions else than rebooting. Go ahead, Peter. So um, I can't, you almost can't avoid the reboot, but I always, when I get into weird situations like this, there's a piece of software my, actually my old security team turned me on to uh, for a Mac. It's from Titanium Software. It's called Onyx, which does a reasonably good job of scrubbing things out of the system that are no longer being used and can get rid of things. So, and it's, takes about five minutes to run on my Mac Pro, and it it will get the uh, phantom drivers and things like that. Interestingly enough, while you're talking, we're, we're hearing a little clicking. It's all, it was very ironic. <laughs> so, so that there's like a... Perfect open, demonstration open. of Bluetooth contamination. There. Yeah, it, except I'm not using except I'm not using Bluetooth, but I haven't for, I have forgotten to shave today, so maybe the mic will nope. be against my. And it's no? gone now. It's huh. Magic. Then I have no idea. Then. It's very interesting. Just, just, just while you, it just was amazing that while you're talking, answering one question that it happened and then you came back and it's fine. Like, it, that's crazy. All right. Next question. It was musical too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, question from Douglas Carmichael. FX PhD combines VFX training with a private Slack group and VPN access to full versions of software. In my mind, that's an heir to the PXC throne. Could you see opportunities for office hours as a nonprofit to collaborate with them? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mike, uh, the founder, is an old friend of mine. And uh, there's a lot of similarities between FX PhD and, and uh, Pixel Core. And FX PhD is a little younger than Pixel Core. Next question. Douglas back with a question. One anti-remote work argument is the reduced opportunity for social-emotional support. Many have said, though, that keeping emotionally sensitive matters out of a professional environment ensures group cohesion and a healthy climate. Do you agree? By the way, we'll start the African part early if we don't have any more questions. Uh, we're, this is our last question. I wasn't really keeping track of that. So if you have any other questions you want to throw in, uh, feel free to, uh, to throw those in before we get to the, to the uh, top of the hour. Um, but uh, it's up to you. Um, uh, as far as this goes, uh, you know... I do my best to try to keep most of the anything that would feel like it was drama, <laughs> you know, out of out of work. Uh, personal things that I think might be entertaining, I might uh, fill time with maybe uh, if they're in a meeting. But I generally try to keep most of that out of the out of my work my work environment. Um, it's just really hard to know what is going to trigger people, and so and and also sometimes just them knowing more than they 
need to. And then people try to use that as a way to get to know people and it just becomes uncomfortable and weird. So, so I, I, I do talk about personal things. It's not like I'm uh, only talking about business when I'm, when I'm in a, in a, in a professional environment, but usually I'm using it to fill time. Um, you know, and then as soon as we, everyone's in one place, we start talking and then go ahead, Mitchell. I don't know if this will help answer the question, but, uh, I had a little object lesson yesterday. I have a friend that owns a health food restaurant and, um, she's also an activist and spends a lot of time, um, going out and doing activist related things. And while I was there, she was saying, you know, isn't it great that, you know, I'm doing this and this. And I said, it is, but to be honest with you, pro or con, and I think Alex, you said this, when you bring up any political or uh, incendiary subject, it tends to make you feel uncomfortable. And I know she was very passionate about her opinions, but it put me off. And uh, and I had to say something to her, and she's upset with me now. So where do you find the proper venue to and, you know, educate people to where is the appropriate place to be talking about certain subjects at a restaurant? I, I, yeah, I, I don't have, I mean, you said not a restaurant or an, at a restaurant? I was speaking uh, rhetorically there. Oh, well, I mean, I guess the thing is, is I mean, when I'm hanging out with friends and so on and so forth, I mean, I gauge whether I think that they can have a useful conversation about whatever we want to talk about um, and then make it, try to make a decision about whether we'll, I'll broach that conversation or respond to it. A lot of times people will have like a, a very political or a very incendiary response and I just won't say anything. <laughs> like I don't, I don't need to, I don't need to keep that conversation going uh, or, or get in or dig into it. I just let it, let it f often slide over or I just create a new conversation that sometimes. Yeah, I, I find that a spit take generally shuts everybody up. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, uh, um, I, I, I mostly, you know, it just depends on who the person is and where, what environment and what my relationship is to them. But generally in purely professional relationships, I, I try to stay away from anything that I think is going to turn turn into something. People having strong opinions, <laughs> like you know, other than work. Uh, go ahead, Nigel. My my old headmaster used to say, "There's no point arguing with someone when you know you're right," um, because at the end of the day, uh, it is really hard to change anybody's opinion about anything that uh, you can't find common ground of facts yeah. on. Yeah, I, I think that that's, the, I think that the thing that I enjoy the most with people when I, is talking about things where we're all exploring the idea. It, we're not trying to persuade anybody of what that, what that is. We're, you know, so a conversation that is not a attempt at persuasion, but really just uh, talking through the issues and, and bouncing off, of, bouncing those issues off, I think is very fun to have to do. It's just that um, I, I find that, you know, maybe I'm, it's old fogey complaining about, you know, the kids these days, but it's not just kids. It's people of all ages just don't seem to be able to have a reasonable conversation when they don't agree with, when everyone around them doesn't agree with them. Like you just, you just kind of like, it's fine. Like they don't have to agree with you. And, and it's just, it's, it can be just kind of an, a fun conversation and people don't, but everyone gets really riled up now. So I, I, that's why I tend to not, not do those things. Uh, Alex, do that old guy voice that you do so well. Uh, these kids these days, I can't believe it. All right. Next question. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan Ewell on Kigali, Rwanda. Any recommendations for a quick, easy, cheapish background setup for Zoom meetings? Peter. I just you know, took your advice your, uh, months ago and put up a Lastolite behind me. And then uh, one of those uh, Pavo 6C2s. Yeah. That's what's giving the blue light. You know, we can go into the rest of the lighting, but the background is just Elastolite and it works great and covers all the reflective glass on the pictures that are sitting behind it. <laughs> I have like four or five of them now, you know, that wherever we have to set up and they're no, they're no longer branded as Elastolite. They are now Manfrotto. Manfrotto had bought Elastolite or, or Vitek or whatever had bought them, or, but now it's a Manfrotto. I do recommend the six foot by seven foot, not the five by six. It's $70 more to get one more foot each direction and worth every penny. So um, the six five by six has to be too close to you. So the six by seven is what I would recommend. There's also a mounting, a little mounting bracket for about another hundred bucks or $130 that goes on top of a light stand or a C stand. And I don't have a picture of it um, here, but it's got two little magnets that the, that the, um, gray screen can just snap to the metal that it uses to get its rigidness will snap to the magnets. Wow. Life-saving, <laughs> like, like life changing. Like you just, you just put this thing up and you slap it. You just kind of throw it at it and it goes, and, and now it's, it's set up. And so I would highly recommend, um, using the, those two things together is not, um, completely inexpensive, but 
very, very um, useful in that area. Uh, and then, of course, as, as uh, Peter said, a good little light is, is fine to do that. I'm using a, a, you know, a NAN light and way more than I need just because I have the, the light there. Um, but, but anyway, I would recommend um, you know, taking a look at those. The, um, uh, the, the gray screens, though, th those work really, really well. Just remember to fold it like a taco and then fold it under. If you try to twist it one, on the one that big, it won't work. <laughs> There's just a lot of swearing and no folding. Um, so you have to fold it like a taco and then pull the under and just, I just, I literally just twist the top and throw it on the ground. And it just, it, I, I can't figure out how to do it any other way just to then just to throw it and it just coils up and I put it back in the bag. Um, so anyway, next question. Robert Shoji in Los Angeles, California. Other than software compatibility problems, are there any potential performance issues when updating from Big Sur to Monterey on a 2019 MacBook Pro? Go ahead, Mitchell. I, I, I think that the last big incremental upgrade from Apple that might cause trouble, um, and I have it on my uh, Power Mac, but certainly not a uh, MacBook Pro, was a Mojave. You know, past Mojave, then you might have issues. Yeah, I mean, Big Sur had it. I mean, they've definitely been getting ready for the M1 series or the M series for a while. And so there's just been a lot of changes under the hood. And Monterey, I think, continued those changes. I would say Monterey now is doing uh, pretty well. Um, so, so, I, so I think that um, usually after WWC is the right time to update to the last, last year's version of an operating system because it's kind of as hammered out as it's going to be. Um, next question. Dan Huber in Erie, Pennsylvania, not as good as Makana, but has anyone used the Q&A website online questions? I don't think anybody has. Uh, next question. Andy Korkendorfer from Vieira, Florida, thoughts on using a GoPro as a zoom camera? It's really wide angle. So I think you can get a, a tighter angle. It has settings in there to crop the sensor. Um, to output those, um, but we've we've used them as that. It's just it's just that it's it's really good if you have a group of people um, or a wide angle that you want, but not as good if you want the framing that we have here. Uh, next question, Eduardo Augustine in Panama. Do you have a dedicated computer for your Telestrator? Planning on getting a used 2014 Mac Mini? I do. I have a Mac Mini. This is the Telestrator that I that I have at home, and I um I have it. It's a 2012. I think a 2012, might be 2014 Mac Mini, so it's very old because it only has to do this. <laughs> like that's like literally its only job, and it turns out almost any Mac Mini ever made can do that one thing. Uh, next question, and it's from Gilberto in Santa Cruz, Bolivia. On hybrid events, how do you manage live audio translation? On hybrid events, so yeah, so <laughs> it's uh, so. Typically, what we do for hybrid events to do to, to do a live audio translation in the X number of languages is that we will put translators in the back of the room. So we we you get a translation service. I don't try to figure it out. Well, sometimes I figure it out. But anyway, we we put translators in the back of the room. A lot of the services will come with their own booths, so they'll they'll have booths that are not great. So if you have the budget, you put in you you build them out so that they have some audio separation because a lot of times the ones that they bring, the portable ones they bring do not have audio separation. And so and the mics that they um anyway, so we'll talk about that in a second. The so that is the, that's the basic. Now they'll come with their own system and they're generally, <clears throat> the system that they, that, that they most of them bring are hor is horrible. The audio quality is really low. So what we do is we augment it with another mic or we just replace their mic altogether. Um, and so uh, we like to use something with a lot of off-axis rejection. The most typical one for us is to use a SM58 with a switch um, because it's just, it's rugged. They know how to use it. And they they want to switch. It's like a, so either you have to give them a switch in you know in front of them. And there's some um, the problem with almost all the the built devices that they have that that are in line that will do the audio mix um, in line. The problem really is is that they add a lot of noise. It's just cheap components, you know. So that even though they're like twelve hundred dollars for these little these little consoles, they're cheap components compared to what we're used to. And so you get noise and you get all kinds of clicking sounds and everything else. So usually we just pipe that out, um, you know, and we give them a switch so they can turn it on and off, or we give them, we've even give them different, ver a smaller version of the, um, if we're, if they're, if we feel like we can work with them. Sometimes um, the translators can be a little, um, 
set in their ways about how they do this. They do this every day and they tell you that over and over and over again. That this is how they, and it's the same thing that when you know people show up with bad webcams and they tell you, I do this, I do this every day. Like I speak on the news every day with my bad webcam and my bad mic. Well, translators are just the same. They're like, I do this every day for the UN and why do I have to have, use your special stuff and everything else? And so you, those are the ones you don't use anymore. You know, so you find ones that are excited, the fact that they sound really good and they, and they look good and they, and you build, we build pipe pipelines for them to, to do that. So that's how we, then that all that audio, you have to figure out now the, those little devices are kind of built and you have to figure out a way to tie them back into their audio system. So they'll come and they'll supply headsets for everybody. And so those headsets, um, oftentimes have channels up to six channels oftentimes. And so, and people, you just got to depend on how you're going to do it. You, they don't work anywhere else. So there's not a real reason to steal them. Um, now there are some low latency to the cellular phone, but oftentimes there's some, there's a little bit of latency there, but cell using cell phones is the next generation of things. And people are, companies are coming out with them because the latency doesn't have to be perfect because you're not listening to the person there. You're listening to a person talking after it. So if there are, you know, 300 milliseconds behind, it doesn't matter as much. And so, so some of the cell phone solutions are, are coming for that. Then you take all that audio and you wrap it into, you can do a couple different things in, with it, but you wrap it into multiple channels. So an SDI signal will handle up to 16 channels. Uh, the most we've used of those is 14. Um, and, um, and so you can, you can stack them all in. You can push that all up to, uh, you, the elemental links will do eight channels. Um, their appliance encoders will do 16 and the UHD version of the link will do 16 channels. You can get them all up into the, into AWS. And then now what you do is you just carve them out. You can carve, you can just remap the audio. So you say this audio is now this one and this one and this one. And so you end up with 14 streams or 12 streams or whatever in, in, in AWS going out to all of the, you know, the outputs that you need. Um, what's kind of cool is if you feed them in as separate computers into Zoom, you can, um, uh, you can, you can set them up as with the languages. So there's a translation um, feature inside of Zoom meetings where you can add translators. So you can add them there and you can then put them in as computers and then people can select them and they'll, it'll do all the ducking for them. The real exciting part, which we won't get into today, but is cross mixing so that you can have, a lot of times we do stuff where we have one language in one ear or in another language in another ear so that it, we can send the same stream out and everybody that wants to listen to Hindi listens to one side and everybody wants the English is the other. Or you can cross mix those where they're, for TV, when we're broadcasting it to, to satellite, we will do it so that the Hindi gets depressed. There's one channel where the Hindi is depressed under the English, the English is depressed under the Hindi. You know, those are the things that we can do that the, then the broadcaster and you can do them in one stream, you can kind of serve both markets. Um, but it's, you it takes a really skilled audio engineer to set that up. Next question. From Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida, any good resources about meeting cognitive stress? Um, crayon.ai, just leave it open, put the stuff into it. <laughs> just, just, that was just, perfect. Let's just keep on pushing, draw, <laughs> and it'll come up with the craziest stuff and you'll be at least entertained. I, you know, I, I, I have to admit that almost every meeting that I get pulled into, I'm primarily part, I'm, I have to speak in the meeting, so I have to be very present. So I don't get to do, I don't get to sit, uh, in meetings very often. Um, so I'm, uh. So I don't get to do that. I don't get to do much of anything in the background anymore. But uh, when I do, when I, at the occasional times I do, I usually have crayon up open and, and it gives me something, it just gives me something to fiddle with. I, I can still listen to the meeting, but I can fiddle with uh, drawing crazy things. I usually, crayon is horrible except for logos. So I just say, draw this as a logo, you know, like draw the honey badger as a logo on a movie poster. And that's a great one, by the way. <laughs> Go ahead, Nigel. So I'm not, I, I'm not sure I can argue, answer this for, general cognitive stress, but for meetings, I discovered the most important thing to do is before anybody says anything, I always try and say, why are we here? Mm -hmm. What is the purpose of this meeting? So when we've, if we don't achieve it, or if we're going the wrong way, we'll go back. And when we're done, we're done. And go ahead, Courtney. You get a really good makeup person to paint on your eyelids like your eyes are open when you're actually closed and taking a nap. So just take a nap in the middle of it. <laughs> I have, um, yeah, we've, we've had even things on the show where, you know, loops and other things like that that don't, don't turn out well. So we always got to be careful of those. Um, no, I think that, um, the all stress, just remember that all stress is created by your resistance to what is so. Next question. 
Douglas Carmichael, is it typically best to have harmonic enhancement or saturation processing like the electron analog heat on a stereo mix before or after a master bus compressor like the SSL bus compressor? And then this is where we all like look at the thing and see if Mickey's going to put something in. There we go, Mitchell. <laughs> I can speak for the SSL uh, bus compressor. It's meant to be the last thing in the chain. So that much I do know. Mickey says whatever, whichever sounds best for the specific track. <laughs> okay, next question. Douglas is back. When the Autodesk announced Flame support for M1 Max, they mentioned that Flame can now run on a MacBook Pro. Wouldn't a 14-inch screen be too small for any serious editing, compositing work? Yeah, but you can plug in an external monitor and make it much bigger. Next question. Uh, it's from me. Um, how would you talk a news channel like CNN for using you as a tech pundit? You know, I don't, there's, so there's, there's definitely, um, there are uh, representatives that represent speakers. So there's companies that just represent like, we are your one-stop shop to find speakers for your shows and for your interviews and everything else. And what you do is you get into that, into, that's the number one place that a lot of these companies go to is they go to this, there's a couple of these, they're like clearing houses for speakers and um, they are, uh, and they just get contact. We're looking for this kind of person with this kind of background with this da, 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 da. And um, that's how about, my guess is 60 to 70% of the people that um, are on air come from a couple of these clearing houses that are being, that are representing people who are potentially speakers, potentially guests. Um, and you know, some people that get on it, there's definitely your rep. If you're a, if you're a author or something like that, will get you onto those lists for you. you it's not like everybody has to do it. And then the, and sometimes people don't even know it exists because the rep, the person, your, your PR person for your book or your whatever, put you on this list and then the list contacts the rep and the rep tells you, oh, I got, I got, a, I got a thing for you. So they're, they, they're kind of the middle person there to make sure that you get that they're doing that for you. But they're getting onto those things because the news organizations, you know, they need so many of them. They, they don't want to, they're not out there digging. They will. And if they, and the way I've gotten pulled into TV network shows is because somebody knew me. You know, like somebody listened to, typically somebody was listening to MacBreak that happens to be on a TV show and they go, hey, that, I think he'd be able to answer a bunch of questions. Let's bring him on. So those are the, you know, that's how I've ended up with it. But I know that there are these services that a lot of folks used for, to make this work. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, a lot of them uh, come from the print world. They started the print world with a column and a regular column in a magazine on tech, tech stuff or in a newspaper. And those type of reporters uh, have a good journalistic background. And so as long as they look decent on camera, then they can apply for a, a – usually they'll start out at the local news. You know, on the local news, their tech reporter will do all the tech-reported stories. And they usually come, you know, find somebody who's been writing uh, magazine articles or at least a blog or something that, that is well-respected and well-known uh, for them to move up to broadcast from that area. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Mitchell. Yeah, you know, the, the question is inspired by watching too much CNN and seeing a bunch of people that, are, that they bring in as experts on subjects. And I just scratch my head and say, wow, I could do better than that. I've got the picture. I've got the references from office hours. I forget, hey, what the <laughs> heck, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, 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 and I will say that there a lot of times once there, once you get in once, you get invited over and over again because as soon as you've done a good job, they're like, "Oh, this is this is easy content." <laughs> you know, so they so they 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 jump into that pretty quickly. Uh, next question. Yeah, it looks like the last one we have here lined up from Douglas Carmichael. Let's say you were broadcasting an event like Office Hour Space and you wanted to have dual language audio. Budget notwithstanding, uh, would you have captions in the second language or hire a separate host in the target language for a second stream? Uh, well, I probably. Um, the best thing to do is definitely have another stream that's in the in the in another language. That's a completely new set of different people and everything else, but that's usually impractical. Um, other than like large sporting events, um, but but I think that uh, outside of that, um, I I always prefer dubbing over captions because captions force the viewer to look down, like they're not really looking at the content. And so when you can have someone good at dubbing it, it means that they can just listen to it. Um, I also like to make sure that we maintain some of the original audio so that. You get what they really, how they felt when they were doing it as opposed to it just kind of taking off. So those are the things that I would think about. And uh, we have a Chris Marler here coming in from 
Kigali, Rwanda. I'm pretty excited. So it sounds like we're getting very close to the second hour now. So, um, so anyway, uh, that is the end of the first hour. Uh, I do have a little slideshow um, and that uh, has a whole bunch of new slides. So I'm just going to kind of go through them because uh, Ryan uh, sent um, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of slides overnight, and um, and uh, I, I I incorporated as many as I possibly could. So and Chris is here. So um, so anyway, so um, we'll uh, we'll go through them. Some of them are are older slides, and then other ones are are newer slides. So let's get started with the second hour, and uh, we're going to talk about Africa and talk about the, specifically the stuff that uh, that I and some uh, handful of friends uh, have um, have done over the years uh, here in, in Africa over the last twenty. 22 years, I think is now, it's been a long time of, of starting here. So I'll, we'll start at the beginning and then uh, kind of work through it and, and we'll answer your questions. So as you see these, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because the uh, at five o'clock this morning, there was 20 slides and now there's almost 60. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the slides relatively quickly. So if you have questions about specific slides for either myself or Chris, um, uh, then uh, go ahead and uh, throw those into Mukana. Uh, Mukana, by the way, if you're wondering, is a... Um, uh, uh, is a Zimbabwean term. So I started in Zimbabwe and Mukana is a Zimbabwean term for a place to have, a, to, to achieve a purpose. So anyway, so just in case you're wondering where the, where that came from. Um, so uh, let me uh, jump to the right thing. So this is, uh, you'll see a much, you'll see some much younger and much thinner versions of me as we, as we go through, as we go through this process. I've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, so here's uh this is, this is the first day. Um, <laughs> I'm there. This is me after not sleeping. Uh, I had never, uh, left, I had never left the United States. Um, uh, I had, I had to get a passport two weeks before I left and that would have been almost exactly. In fact, what's kind of cool about this and why I wanted to do it right now is that, uh, I would have just come back 22 years ago from Zimbabwe. So it was in June of Zimba of 2000 that I was there. And and when I went down, the Economist had this um, uh, had this cover that was like the Dark Continent or whatever, the Lost Continent, you know, something like that. It was horrible. Anyway, so um, and so that, that's the I remember being that's when I went down, and that's uh, Saki Mafundakwa, who may we may get on in the next couple of weeks. So Saki just pinged me, and he's coming into town. So we're gonna, I may be on his show for him, and he may be on his show for me. So um, so we'll see. It could be as early as next week. Um, I'm going to talk to him about Saki today, and so um, that's Saki Mafundakwa, and he is the founder um, of uh, the Zimbabwe Institute for Digital Arts. And um, so the way this started was Saki put up a he put up a post that ended up in uh, Mac Rumors um, that said, this is in 2000, that said, I'm looking for some people to donate some Macs you know, to my to my little school in Zimbabwe. And I said, I can give you a couple Macs, but what I can do is I'd love to bring some people down and and uh, do some stuff with you. And so, and Saki was like, sure, we'll, we'll show you around. <laughs> so, so, um, so anyway, uh, so this was me after, you know, we flew to, uh, we flew to London and, um, and then flew into, into Harare, Zimbabwe. And, um, and we were, this is the first night that we were there just uh, talking and trying to figure out what, what the heck we're going to do. Cause we didn't really have a plan. We just, I literally bought a bunch of cameras and, and, um, bought a bunch of stuff and we went down. Um, and I'm going to try to get my presentation to work. Hold on. Let's try this again. There we go. This is our, this was our first class at Ziva. So this was, uh, and most of them now are in, uh, you know, in the business um, doing this. But this was the first class. This is out in front of, uh, of their, uh, of the school. Um, you know, we. This was the first weekend. Um, that's Simon Mashoko, who was uh, one of the, probably one of the historically in our, at least in our lifetime, one of the greatest Imbira players. And um, so we uh, we recorded Simon playing and and shot video of it, and uh, it was it was a pretty pretty amazing experience. It's really what kind of turned it for me of like, this is way more important than I thought it would be. I had spent years studying Africa and thinking about what I was going to do and thinking about how it could be an economic driver for, for the continent, but not really thinking about the personal impact of it until I, um, until I was at Simon's house or the, and, and that's actually a church there. And like, I, I gotta tell you, you walk up to a church where there's, um, you know, 60 Zimbabweans singing Amazing Grace and Shona with Mbiras. And you realize that you're in a whole different, whole different place there. It's got, it was probably one of the most amazing musical experiences I had ever had. Um, this was uh, from um, Great Zimbabwe. This is the largest stone, man-made stone structure south of the Nile. 
Um, and so we were shooting, in this case, we were doing, um, uh, I was teaching the students to, uh, uh, to shoot uh, QuickTime VRs. <laughs> so this was back, this is still 360s. Now we were just talking about 360 video, but this was us shooting, um, you know, 360 stills of uh, Great Zimbabwe and how to, how to put those, how to stitch those back together. Um, this was in um, Tanganenga. And Tanganenga is a, there's a, um, a area of um, serpentine that goes through there. And so there's 500, at the time we were there, there were 500 artists cutting um, uh, Shona sculptures. Um, and so we were, we were teaching the students here how to, how to shoot the video of the sculptors there. Um, this was, this was at, at that first weekend again with, uh, uh, with Simon. And uh, these were his grandkids who are now, I realized, I looked at some pictures, you'll see some other pictures of them. They're in their twenties. Uh, you know, I realized they're now almost 30 years old um, for, for some of them. And they had really, I don't know if they had never seen video, but they had definitely not seen it very often when they saw it. They just thought that it was the most magical thing. Um, one thing that you'll see is that they're holding Polaroids. One of the things that we got into was um, taking Polaroids with us so that we could hand back photos immediately. So if we were taking photos for us, we would take photos for them and then hand them back. And someday I have a project that I'll try to drag you guys all into it later. Um, this was Simon Mashoko's uh, grandkids and still one of, my, uh, one of my favorite photos that I've taken ever. Um, just, uh, just it really captured the, you know, I don't know, the family. Um, <laughs> this is our first documented use of a nine by 16 video. My friend, Mark, um, <laughs> he, uh, this is 2000. So when you thought that TikTok started it, it was actually Mark. Mark started it all. Um, Mark was a friend of mine and he was a photographer, but not a videographer. And I just said, well, come with me, you know, and he was adventurous enough to go to Africa with me. And, and he, um, he was shooting this video and I took a picture of it because I just thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. And, and then, um, and then I, he said, look, look at the frame looks so good. And I was like, yeah, if you put the TV on its side and, um, and, uh, and, and he's like, oh, shut up. And how, I didn't know that. I, I, I don't know where that video is, but that video would be great. Nine by 16. Um, some more of the kids there. They're just another, another one of these photos that just, you just kind of capture this moment. Um, that's there. We also, um, went to the archives. So this is the Zimbabwe National Archives. Really looking at how could we capture film, make it di and digitize it um, to capture a lot of this because a lot of the film is going away and it was going away back then and probably a lot of it's gone by now. So we, we, it's still something we're kind of focused on trying to figure out there. Um, it wasn't all work. You know, that's, uh, that's Thomas Mafumo, uh, who is an incredible reggae artist in, in Zimbabwe, or is an incredible radio, uh, reggae artist in uh, Zimbabwe. And uh, so that's us backstage um, having a, you know, a good reggae time. Uh, I think that's safe to say. Um, and uh, so we were having a good time there. Um, <laughs> gotta be careful. Uh, this is in Cape Town. Just gotta be careful with where you put things because you don't argue with the baboons. If the baboons want the drink, the baboons have the drink. Um, you know, you don't, don't, don't go into a fight with the baboons. Um, this is uh, Dominic Benhura. as uh, one of the great sculptors and he was in Zimbabwe and he has just this whole uh, area that he's, um, cutting these. And it's really interesting. He designs them and then he has other people get them close. Like, you know, he tells them what he wants them to cut, gets them close and then he finishes them with his own um, skill. And, um, but he, he really doesn't like calling it, you know, Shona artwork or he, he's just a sculptor and he's an incredibly, uh, and just incredible sculptor and incredible person. Um, this is some of his work. Oh, some, this is work actually, not his work. This is from, uh, this is from Tanganyika. So you can see all that stuff behind it. Just think of something that's about 60 acres of, stone sculpture like that. Like you just walk through it and it's just all, every stall, every little area is a new new amount of it. It's just, I mean, in, in Africa, you just really get impacted by how much, um, you know, how much art and, and just in culture and everything else that's there. Um, this is one of the sculptors working in granite, which is insane. Uh, just like, it just hurts to think about it. Um, this was a, uh, um, a time-lapse. I won't play it. Maybe I'll play it somewhere else um, later. But this is a time lapse that we took that I still would like to reproduce now in 4K or 8K of a sculptor, um, you know, from start to finish, you know, finishing a, a sculpture for us. It took about four hours you know, for him to do it. Um, but, uh, but you get to kind of watch it. And what I really realized while I was watching this was how much it was like 3D modeling. You know, like he's, you know, he's got an idea. He, he can see a vision of what he's trying to do. And he's, you know, what the, what the sculptors will tell you is that they're negotiating with the stone. You know, they're, they're trying to figure out what the stone wants to do, not what they have an idea. And this is pretty soft stone and fairly small. So it, this, this, the stone does what he wants most of the time. Um, but, but it is a, um, 
uh, it is something that uh, the, the sculptors that are building the larger ones, they really have to figure out what the stone wants to do. Or, and I said, what happens when the stone disagrees? He goes, it breaks in half. <laughs> like, you know, and then you start over again or you make smaller versions of it. Um, so, but, um, but this was just, it's kind of fun to watch, but you really got, and we, we literally um, had, uh, we, we brought ZBrush down for some of these sculptors and they literally just started tapping on a thing just the same way that they would tap on it here. And it just totally made sense for them to kind of build that out from there. So, you know, a lot of what we looked at here was, I don't need you to relearn everything to be part of the digital um, economy. I just need you to move 30%. You know, like, you know, like if I can just teach them to do digital work uh, instead, um, uh, you know, taking their knowledge. And some of them have converted over to doing digital work now. Um, food is really good. This is sadza, beef stew and sadza. It's my favorite meal in the world. Like literally, if you ever want to get me something, it's my favorite meal. Um, this is more of us. Again, the kids, we were showing the pictures of the, of the stuff in the videos that we had just shot. And uh, the kids just thought it was the, the best thing ever. Um, no matter where you go, this is Tanzania. Um, and uh, there's, a star, there's a kid at the, at the truck stop with a Star Wars shirt on, episode one. So I had to take a picture of, I was like, oh, you just realize the, the, that our media gets everywhere um, that's there. there. Um, this was us shooting in Tanzania, uh, getting up on, it's safer on top of the, <laughs> on top of the thing and you get a better view, but so it's harder for the, for the, uh, baboons to get to you. So, um, not impossible though. So you keep moving. Um, that's, uh, Hanif. Hanif is a good friend of mine who, um, I spent a lot of time with in, in Tanzania shooting. Um, and, um, uh, again, just more of this. And a lot of this was us figuring out again, what's valuable, what's hard to shoot, what's easy to shoot. Um, this was shooting in, um, Makumi National Park. I was doing Again, uh, spherical, <laughs> spherical 360s, uh, but these were um, high dynamic range uh, 360s. And this is, I think I've told the story one time, the, the, guard, the guard that was with me did not want me to get out of the car. And I was like, I have to get out of the car. This is like, this is why I came was to shoot this. I can't be by the car. I can't be in the car. And, uh, and he said, well, I'm, you know, I have to go out with you. And, and he stood behind me the whole time as I went around, he would just stand behind me as I was going around it. And I said, what are you, what are you here for? And he's like, in case there's a lion. <laughs> and I said, and, and I said, um, and uh, I said, well, what are you going to do if the lion shows up? And he's like, I do not know. But, I, but if, if the lion eats you, I will lose my job. And I just realized, you know, like I, I the, it was funny. But at the same time, I realized that I had to be more careful of how I stepped through it. Like I'm putting his life at, on, because I want to shoot some 360s, I was putting his life in the line. And I just hadn't, it didn't sink in for a little while later that I just had to be really careful of what I did there and how I stepped and who I worked with. And I just had to be conscious to the fact that as an American, I was throwing around weight that, that put, uh, you know, put people at risk. And so it's just, it was just a little bit of a, uh, a sinking thing. It was funny when I, when it happened, I thought it was funny, but, but then I, then I later, later, I, I thought through it a little bit. Um, this is us working with some students here. Mwanga is still an, a, a good friend of mine in the back there. And he, uh, um, and, uh, from Tan, from Tanzania, he worked in the Tanzanian broadcasting corporation and, and, um, uh, um, Mina Mashoki, who's, uh, who's still here in the Bay area. I haven't seen mine in a long time, but he was, he's Kenyan. So he was, um, kind of helping uh, teach and, and for us to work through the stuff. Uh, changing tires in Rawaha, the densest population of lions in Africa, was stressful, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> it's like, how do we do this really quickly? Um, there's no reason to show you this photo other than I was very proud. I got into this thing where I'd spin the camera while I was, while we were going by. So we're at like going 80 miles an hour and he's on a bike. You'll see his feet aren't touching the ground. And so you had to turn at just the right speed to, to not have a lot of motion blur because this is also pretty dark. And I was just very proud of that photo because I caught everything. It means that the rotation was perfect um, to capture that, that, that sign. Very relaxing here, you know, in Tanzania. Um, not all of it was <laughs> safari. There's something very surreal about being in Tanzania and playing um, cro croquet in, 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 the, in, the, in the middle of the desert. It's very odd. Um, again, an external shot of uh, Zimbabwe, a uh, great Zimbabwe that I took. And it's just, it, it's really an amazing thing. You see how thick those walls are. So it's like air conditioning. The walls are so thick that when you walk through the the edges, they get, it gets down to like mid sixties, even though it's ninety degrees outside or a hundred degrees outside. It's just you, you just see this ancient engineering that was that was kind of amazing. And even today, you can go to Great Zimbabwe and it's pretty much that busy all the time. <laughs> you know, so it's it's a uh, you know it won't always be that way. You know, and I talked to someone, a friend of mine was like talking about sleeping on the steps in Angkor Wat. You know, in the in the early nineties. Uh, at some point, this is all going to turn, and you will wish we had gone more often to this to this location. Um, what shifted here was a, this meeting. So this was a meeting in uh, Washington D.C. Um, I was invited uh, to um, 
uh, to speak. Um, uh, this is the R mixture of the Rwandan government put it together. Uh, it's World Bank and a lot of um, scholars talking about how to move Rwandans. So I had done all this other work that you just saw. So that was all stuff that I had to have done. Like this meeting's useless without all the pictures and all the things I just showed you because I had to be able to, you know, have the, the history um, to do it, which I knew that I would never get. No one's ever going to listen to me otherwise. Um, this is uh, um, uh, Pradi uh, uh, Kosla, who's uh, head of engineering at Carnegie Mellon. He's really the, one of the pinnacle people that that um, brought this together. And uh, there was a lot of crazy experts and I kind of felt like I didn't belong there, but but I but somehow we raised money. <laughs> so, you know, by, by being there and we were the one that everyone was talking about afterwards. It's a, it, it goes back to having a really good keynote document because everyone else was scholars who put together really heavy, hard to watch keynotes or sometimes so one person did a whole presentation in Excel. And, um, and uh, I came in with a pretty snazzy, um, a presentation and ended up with some funding. This is it. This is the, this is, this is, this was our first, uh, our first building that we started to work on there. And again, if you have, uh, as I'm going through this, if you have questions for either me or Chris, Chris runs uh, ADMA and he's coming in from, from Kigali. So if you have questions, go ahead and throw those into Makana, but this is what, how it started. Um, this is what it looked like as we started to get going. Um, all Max um, with, uh, we got these, I mean, it was, really high-end school. It's not just that we had like a little, like people think, oh, you have a school in Africa and they think of like dirt floors and other things like that. And this was a million dollar facility. <laughs> like it, it, so it's that these are um, literally monitor in motion, iPad, you know, things. So they could go through the tutorials with those iPads and just, and this is 2012 and they could sit there and, you know, go through step-by-step step and, and still be able to work on their computer. Um, this is what the first lab, you know, looked like um, as the students started to work. Um, this is the green screen setup. This is a ProPsych with uh, composite components, paint, and you know, built the way it, it should be, in my opinion. Um, motion capture, because you know, motion capture is cool. So, so motion capture uh, here to make sure that again, what we wanted to do is make sure that the students weren't just learning rudimentary things, but they were really getting. We we're preparing them to, or we are preparing them to kind of leapfrog a lot of what we're doing here. Steady cam uh, work here. Um, jibs, you know, so all the things that you, that you would, uh, that you'd want to have for a full production. Um, and you know, Chris is here and I just want to say that there's a couple people that I'll mention here, but this wouldn't happen without him. Like, you know, really this, this is not, uh, I, <laughs> I don't have the temperament for it, to be honest. Um, you know, and I'm crazy and I got great ideas. Chris is the, the even keeled, may, work with the government, manage all the drama and stick with it for 10 years, you know? And so, and Chris is, uh, has been integral to, um, to making, you know, all of this work and, and it wouldn't exist. It wouldn't have existed more than about a year without, without Chris. So, um, you know, Chris has been the director since day one. You know, it's funny, I, I had always dreamed of moving to, to Rwanda and we got hit with the opportunity to do this and the opportunity to work with Google at the same time. And I thought that, well, the Google thing will last a couple of years, then I'll go to Rwanda. Just never, never made the turn. But Chris was able to take advantage of that and get down there and start moving it forward. Uh, this is Chris. This is the, this is the first, the first classroom or is this the second one? Is this the, this is the first classroom, Chris, I think. I'm, I was designing it and figuring it out. Um, the, the uh, first, you know, first classroom. From day one, it was designed as a virtual classroom. So like we knew in 2012 that we were going to bring people in from around the world to teach at the school. Um, uh, Ryan, Ryan here is, um, uh, Ryan Ewell is uh, also been integral to, to what we're doing. Uh, and Ryan was not able to be with us today, but, but he sent a lot of these photos. Like he, he sent this collection of photos and Ryan was someone I met working with Leo um, in, in, uh, the lab with Leo in, in Vancouver. And uh, I don't remember how I persuaded Ryan to do something so crazy, but now he's, uh, you know, he's been there also for about uh, 10 years and uh, he's been there for 10 years. He now has a Rwandan family. He's like, he's, he's embedded, you know, into the, into the, into the culture. So, um, but he's, he's been, um, you know, integral to, and we forced Ryan to like, Ryan's a video producer and we have him figuring out motion capture, um, teaching, you know, and, this, and here's a, this is teaching classes and I'm teaching this class in here. So, you know, we, you know, I was, I went down for, I haven't been down there for a couple of years and COVID and then stuff before that, but, but the, um, when we got started, a lot of it was physical and, and putting these uh, and doing these uh, trainings. 
And, um, you know, a lot of it was me sitting there, you know, showing this is how to show it, how to use an audio mixer um, and, uh, and really doing as many classes as I could, you know, while I was there and I'd go down every six months or so um, teaching, here's teaching green screen um, in the, in the studio there. Um, and, uh, and we, but we also had a lot of, um, uh, we had a lot of great um, animators coming in from, and other people coming in from all over the world to, to physically, um, you know, teach and stay there for three months or six months. Uh, this is Alfred. Alfred came in from Kenya, and he's is, is Alfred still there? Is is he st is he still part of the? Yes, he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I haven't talked to him for a couple of years. Since I realized, so I wanted. I didn't want to see, him, but Alfred's been there also for almost ten years, and and he's been incre incredible resource um, to make that to make this uh, um, make this happen here. And then this is when we really started to move forward. So again, as I said, as I showed you before. Um, I, uh, um, we built this knowing that we were going to have to do a dual screen. So the screen was set up so that they could see one screen of me working and, or, or anybody working and then see the, per the teacher teaching from somewhere in the world. So this, you know, this is the power of growing from the ground up, uh, into that process. And uh, so this is me teaching, uh, I think cinema 4d, you know, uh, uh, from my house. And this is actually where the telestrator, you know, this whole, this whole thing came from was me trying to figure out how to build a classroom or build a virtual way to do a classroom. And this is, uh, again, almost a decade ago. Um, this is Rob Garrett, uh, who was at LinkedIn for a long time. I think Rob's moving, moving, doing something else right now, but he was doing training for us as well. Um, coming in from, I believe that's Portland, um, that uh, he's doing the training. There's Nick Justishin. Um, so our own Nick Justishin uh, would, would jump in and teach uh, match moving and photogrammetry and so on and so forth to the students. Um, but again, being able to bring these instructors in from anywhere in the world, you know, really changes what you can do. A lot of times you're, you're in Africa and you're in Rwanda, like teaching a class for a week in Rwanda is two weeks for somebody to come in. And it's very expensive to bring somebody in. Or we can say, hey, by the way, you could just come in for an hour from your home uh, every, uh, every week and teach the class. And a lot of people are willing to do that. And by the way, if you are willing to do that, you can reach me on discord. <laughs> we're going to start doing this more soon. Um, the, uh, we're also, you know, a lot of it is, uh, you can see, I can dress up. I can actually wear, wear nice clothes. I don't show that off very often, but, uh, um, this is working with the minister of, of, uh, education and, um, uh, talking through, you know, what, where all their money's going you know, and what, what we're doing with it and how it works. And, and he was, you know, very astute. And, and, you know, the one thing about the, the Rwandan government in general is a lot of, really astute leaders that are figuring stuff out. You look like you're about to say something, Chris, or are you just watching? I hope you can't hear Chris. <laughs> I would, no, I was just watching, uh, okay. looking at the pictures of the graduates in the back, yeah. um, thinking about what they've been up to. But. Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit because Chris can give us some, fill it those in. And feel free to jump in, Chris, anywhere while I'm talking. Uh, this is one of our first uh, productions. You'll notice if you look very closely that I'm wearing uh, Google Glass. <laughs> this was back when I had my Google Glass and I was... And, and I don't know how I got away with wearing it because I, what usually was, I was told was that you, you know, this is very cool, but you cannot wear the Google eye <laughs> in, inside of, inside of the uh, event. I don't know how I got away with that. Anyway, so um, this is, uh, this is me cutting the show a lot of times. We, you know, we worked with the students here. Um, and in, in many cases, this was one of their first, um, you know, experiences shooting these cameras. And so a lot of them, we were just working through it much like you saw us working through the music video. Um, but we were just cutting these shows and I was bringing whatever gear I thought we could get away without from, um, from pixel core, um, and, uh, and just bringing like older switchers and other things like that down and, and, um, you know, putting them into place here. Um, this is, uh, this was our first team, uh, in, um, for the, this was in 2013. So this is really where we, I think we had done a lot of training, but this was the first time we really kind of pushed them to, uh, to start um, doing, doing real production for trans, what was called, what is called Transform Africa. Um, it kept on going. This is, that's the uh, president of Rwanda, um, uh, um, Kagame. Uh, and, um, and then, you know, again, a lot of this production just keeps going. So the, the students are, this is Seth uh, cutting the show. He's, I think I've told the story before. I really enjoy listening to him call shows because he'll be like, ready, camera one, you know, ready, camera two, go camera two. Ready, camera three, camera three, what are you doing? What are you doing? And, and he'll say, and then I'll go back, go, go, go. Ready, 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 camera one, go camera one. He goes, camera three, never do that again. <laughs> and he does it with such verve, you know, like, like you know, and, and then he goes back to what he's doing. He's just, he's, he's great, great TD to listen to. Um, this is, but a lot of them, you know, these are big government 
you know, events that, that are being put on by the students. Um, those, uh, you'll see those, um, uh, those elementals were donated by elemental. Thank you, elemental for making those available to us. Sam actually donated them personally to us, um, to make, to make those, uh, make those go forward. But the students are putting this together. This is Calvin, um, Calvin Roberts. Uh, he is a camera engineer at ILM that when I, that I worked with when I was at ILM and we were able to persuade him to go down and teach the students, um, you know, camera operation and so on and so forth. So he's, he's down there training. Um, this is, uh, you know, again, more production. These students all, you know, kind of learning how to do all this by doing it, you know, and really it's just a matter of, you know, and this is the incredible, I, I think that's just a gorgeous, I haven't been to it, but I've seen pictures now. Um, it's just a really gorgeous, uh, conference center that's in, uh, in Kigali that was, I got to watch it be under construction for years. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and I never have actually been stepped inside of it, uh, finished. So, but it looks just amazing. Um, and again, more, more of the students I'm putting, putting these together here. We're also doing a lot of, uh, all women intakes. So this is, I think, I think our first class there that, um, that was, um, that was part of the, the, the production. So really it's not, you know, again, when we talk about a conversation where no one's left out, it's not just locations, it's people's backgrounds and people and where they're coming from. And so making sure that women are able to tell their own stories in Rwanda and not just men is we, we felt was very important. And so this is our first graduates, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, getting, you know, coming through that. And we've done a couple intakes now of, um, of, of all women classes and it, it, and it's been, it's been pretty powerful. Um, you know, and this is, you know, where we're, again, we look at everybody getting an opportunity to do this. And so, um, you know, this is, uh, some of the, um, more of the outreach getting further out than just Kigali into the, into it. And, you know, we, I really look at this as when we get successful out here, you know, when people are watching the content and, um, you know, anywhere in the country or anywhere in the continent, um, you know, that's what we're, that's when we're really, you know, starting to fulfill on what we started on. So anyway, that's the, that's my little slideshow. Hopefully you guys enjoyed <laughs> a lot of it. It was a lot of it was brand new for me. <laughs> so, so anyway, it was great photos though. I'm really glad Ryan sent those photos out and we'll get Ryan on at some point to talk about it. And hopefully, um, I'm hoping that it probably won't be this year. We're just in transition, but next year I'm hoping to get down to Kigali and, and, uh, join all of you from, from there. Did you want to add anything to Chris before we started jumping into the questions? Um, just a couple quick things. Um, you were briefly on the shot. You briefly had a shot of um, our live stream for Quibuka 20 um, from Amahora Stadium, which was our first large, large scale shoot. We, there was a 12 camera shoot and, and this isn't hyperbole. That's it. Yeah. The most terrifying experience of my life. We, um, we, we, this, we had, uh, it was a big ceremony cause it was a, you know, the 20th, um, anniversary. And, um, so there are all these VIPs visiting. So security was extremely high and we had never attempted a 12 camera shoot before. So, um, we had security up our asses. Oh, sorry. Security, um, <laughs> security going over our, our equipment, uh, in fine detail and, and then arriving on the day of the shoot to find that, uh, a final sweep with dogs have been done, which knocked down all the walls and tipped over some tables with gear on it. And we had about 45 minutes to get the gear all reassembled and discovered, uh, fiber optic cable wasn't working and we had the officer the president leaning over our shoulder saying you know you must make this happen <laughs> failure is not an option <laughs> so, rwandans don't take was, failure very well <laughs> yeah yeah um i was quite relieved when that was done um and then the funny thing now is we hardly do any live streaming anymore because we train so many people and so it's a it's a thriving cottage industry here the um which didn't um, i don't think really existed when we got there no no not at all and yeah. so that's why you know we ended up doing such large events in the beginning but that that conference you saw on on uh, family planning uh was probably the last big that was three years ago i think mm -hmm. just before covid and that was that's been a, that was our most recent large event yeah and and it you know i think that um it really speaks to that a lot of people are doing live streaming because there's enough people to make it successful, you know? And I think that that was, 
you know, a lot of us know how many live streams go down. And by building up a large group of people that actually knew how to do it, it really built an industry that didn't, that wouldn't exist without it. And I don't think, I mean, I think that, you know, you, when people started to see real quality, I think it made a difference, you know, in, in what yeah. people thought was possible. Well, and, and one of the things that I've noticed recently, actually, I was watching a live stream from a company in California and it was horrible. Um, you know, the audio was bad. And I was like, well, that's because starting with you, the, with the standards were set pretty high. Yeah. And and now it's just the way it's done. And, Wait, so know, in Rwanda, you get really good yeah. live streams. With so, good you, know, you, get, and... you, get a, you get a live stream of a wedding done over 4G. So the internet may be a bit crappy, but you know, the, the audio is good. <laughs> the camera work is solid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it really was, I mean, I got down there and we were just really just, pressing down yeah. on like, we have to do this the right way. We have to get it right. Yeah. And this is, this isn't good audio and this isn't good framing and this isn't good lighting. And, and fortunately, uh, uh, you know, Chris and, and Ryan were able to keep that, you know, kind of moving and really build it into a culture. And, and again, you just see, you know, and, and Rwandans again, there's, I think the, the, the biggest slight that you can give a Rwandan is to say that they're not serious. Like, oh, that person's not serious. Yes. That's, yeah. that's like, those are fighting words. Like, that's like, <laughs> I don't know if they're fighting, but they won't talk to you anymore. <laughs> so, yeah. so anyway, and, and, uh, um, but I think, uh, the, uh, it's been a really easy country in that case, in that sense to work in because people, you know, want to do a good job, you know? Um, I think we have, uh, if, unless you have anything else, Chris, I, we're going to jump into the questions. Nope, go yeah. ahead, jump in. And, um, let's go to the first question. And it's coming in from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. Is the weather a severe hindrance? Never having dealt with monsoons, but having dealt with mud, uh, it can grind everything to a halt. Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> so I, I'm not a climate expert, um, but as to the best of my knowledge, monsoons are, happen mostly in Southeast Asia and India. We certainly don't get that level of really extended severe rainfall, we will get a sudden storm that may last for 12 hours or something like that with very heavy rainfall, which does make roads difficult to travel on uh, because Rwanda is a country of hills and valleys. Um, but we don't get monsoons. And generally, um, like, you know, all the roads in Kigali are mostly paved. Now, it wasn't when we started, but they are now. Um, so yeah, weather is not an issue. Our next question. From Douglas Carmichael. And he wants to know, with religion playing a strong role in many African leaders' mindsets, did you ever experience resistance to bringing current technology into a national educational curricula? I don't think we've had any. No. Uh, yeah. No. no that, yeah. Well, it's been, it's been, they're, they're really excited. In, I mean, generally Rwanda is very forward thinking in that, in that, res, in that respect. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, the, the, the country is, is, is very heavily Catholic, but it's not reflected at all in the government. Um, there is almost no, uh, I can't think of any laws or or even customs that are driven by religious belief. Yeah. And we don't see that a lot in at least most of the countries that we've worked in too. So I, I, I would say that, uh, there may be countries that are much more, that have a much more bent towards that. But in the countries that we've, that I've worked in, which are uh, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Zambia, K Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria, um, those have all been, I mean, they have their own idiosyncrasies from a government's perspective, but you didn't really feel like it was a uh, religious state of any, any, any way. Yeah. Next question. Douglas has another question for you. How did you protect the equipment against dust damage? Did you use air filtration in the studio or did you use dust covers and frequent brushing and cleaning? Uh, Chris? Oh, sure. Pelican cases. Um, lots of pelican cases. Um, dust is, a, is an issue in the dry season, not so much during the rainy season. And it's about a 50-50 you know, split here. Um, when we had... Uh, you know, computer when we in our computer labs and things like that, we have um, you know the nice doors and things like that, but nothing extensive in terms of filtration systems. Um, I think dust. We had a lot of attrition of equipment in the early years, but we actually attributed the, attributed that more to fluctuations in power than we did to um, dust. So yeah, yeah, no power is a big. 
is a big issue. Yeah, and and it, it's funny in in uh, Rwanda, there's not really a, a you, know, you talk about winter and and uh, summer, and there's just rainy season. <laughs> it yeah. rains or it doesn't rain, but it doesn't change. The temperature doesn't change dramatically. Um, I don't think. I mean, or the, the the amount of light or whatever. It gets a little hotter at times, right? I mean, Chris, it just depends yeah. on whether it's rainy season or not. Yeah, I mean, and we're in the dry season right now, and it you know when you're especially towards the end of the dry season, which lasts about four months, it does get pretty dusty. Um, and so you do have to be try and be cautious and protect your equipment, uh, keeping things in bags and, like I said, pelican cases. But um, yeah. Next question. Jason Bache in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Have your kids been to the school? And if not, what would you show them first? My kids have not been to the school, and and it's been one of those things that I keep. I was like, oh, I should go down, but I was always working, and um, so I I definitely have a hope to spend some summers before they get to college uh, going to, you know, coming down to Africa and bouncing around a little bit, you know, going to you know, stay with Hosmuk for a little while in, in South Africa and go to Zimbabwe and go to, you know, and, and kind of spend some summers there. So that we've been kind of talking about that. I think, you know, the, the very first thing when I take anybody to Africa is to get them out of the city, you know, like it's just... Um, I, I try to move them, you know, to a place where they get to meet folks in rural areas. They get to see things. They get to see the countryside. They get to see it because I think that a lot of times the the cities are a little, you know, they're just they're Now, Rwanda, I mean, Kigali is a very clean city. Um, that's usually not the not the case for a lot of, you know, African capitals. And so um, so I think that it's a really clean city and easy to easy, easy to work through. But I think that it it is a. Uh, um, but I like people to see the rest of the continent, the rest of the country as quickly as possible and then come back and, and there's still just tons of things to see, you know, uh, whether it's art or whether it's music. Um, I think those are things that I like to, people to see because it's just, it's so rich inside of Africa. Chris, did you want to add, what, what do you think that you would want my kids to see? Uh, same, well, same thing. Kigali is really a, a bubble. And if you don't get out of Kigali, then you're not really seeing Rwanda. Um, Kigali is uh, by far the most, you know, so has the largest portion of people with a middle class income. You don't get exposed to the real uh, native arts and crafts. You don't get confronted too much by what the standard of living is out, you know, through for most of the population. <clears throat> um, so Kigali is a nice place to ease somebody into being in Africa. Right. Um, and with that in mind, we're, we are building the Alex Lindsay guest wing uh, to our house and yes. <laughs> two, two bedrooms, two bedrooms. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny. It's just, uh, I used to leave, uh, Chris was just pointing out that I still have some clothes down there. I don't think I'd fit into them right now, but, but the, um, but I have, uh, I would, I'd leave clothes behind when I visited so that I would not have to pack anything or not have to pack as much and still be able to just get there and start go to work and i and it was very tempting to open that suitcase i have but i left it alone <laughs> <laughs> go ahead mitchell hi uh first of all christopher thanks for joining us uh this is fascinating and watching the uh the slideshow that you did alex it gives me a feel first of all everybody that you showed in those pictures unless you were being picky about it seemed to be having a great time there's a lot of smiles on faces and appreciation culturally we're talking about, I guess, a, a country and a city that has thousands of years of uh, cultural impact. And to bring all this new technology in uh, must be amazing to see how people respond to that. Well, I would say that uh, Africans are very cult uh, technologically forward. I mean, they don't, they have limited resources applied to them, but wow, do they use them? Like when you, you know, they'll use up everything about um, whatever they have there. And, and so, you know, you have incredible impact, uh, in, incredible penetration of, of uh, mobile phones, you know, mobile devices, and they're using their phones and their devices in ways that I would never imagine, you know, they're doing all their banking and they're doing all their, you know, and they're, and so it's a, like, I, I remember seeing Mina, we were, I don't remember, it was probably 2000, three and he's sitting there texting people. I'm like, what are you doing with a text? Why don't you just call him? Like, I don't understand, you know? And now I'm, now I'm always like, why are these people calling me? <laughs> you know, like they, when they can just text. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, they, you know, oftentimes they, uh, they're actually very far ahead of us when given access to the resources, they, they glop onto them pretty fast. And that's kind of the experience that we've had. Go ahead, Chris, did you? Uh, sure. <clears throat> one of the, one of the fascinating things we struggled a lot in the first two years, actually, with the school, just figuring out the pedagogy and, and understanding what was 
going on with our students and understanding how different they were from from Western students. And one of the things that we became successful at doing was uh, taking fear out of education because that was the system, the primary and secondary school systems that the students had come through were almost Victorian in terms of uh, you know educational philosophy, be seen and not heard, don't you know is is better not to make any mistake than to try and do something extra and not get it get it right and so one of the things we worked hard at was taking fear out of the equation in terms of the learning experience which students just said they they had never a lot of our students were like we've we've never had any kind of you know training or education uh you know that's that allows us to do this and it's almost like bird it was almost Every semester, every uh, academic year, actually, it's almost like birds leaving the nest. They suddenly explode into, you know, energy and cheerfulness and, you know, enthusiasm. And, you know, they're collaborating for the first time. And so that's what I think you see reflected in a lot of the photos. Next question. Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana. Having worked with a lot of nonprofits, <clears throat> excuse me, on international grant successes, Builds on itself when things have been added over time to the program. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, the hardest part is just co continuing to move forward. <laughs> you know, like it's, it gets, it, you know, it it is always going to be a bit of a, a process. You know, it's you're using somebody else's money. You 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 have to keep on making sure that it's useful for them. Um, and I think that you definitely keep on. Uh, if you're doing it well, you're building up a network that of people who want to keep on having you do what you're doing. You know, go ahead, Chris. Oh, just you know, there's it, it's. I mean, one of the one of the distinct challenges there's that we faced was um, there's a, a very common five year life cycle to many kinds of projects. Uh, certainly in Rwanda, I, that's where I have all my experience. And so one of the things we were looking at a lot was okay, this is going to come at some point. Government funding is going to dry up. Um, how do we make ourselves sustainable going past the five year mark? And sure enough, that was that was quite challenging. We were uh, evicted from the building we were in with that beautiful green screen and motion capture studio. We had to virtually start all over again, um, which took about three years to accomplish. Um, if I'd known how long it was going to take, I, I may not have done it, but you know, but we got there. And um, it was supposed to be so it was supposed to be a smooth transition. What happened was is they were tearing down the building, and so we were supposed to leave this building and go into another building that would be done when we left. And the two didn't quite line up. <laughs> no, no. So um, yeah, it's, it's not. It wasn't. It wasn't easy. Um, and uh, we're still not quite as all the way back to where we were, but we've made a lot of progress. But I, for projects in general, this is you know. If you talk to any kind of uh, development agency, foreign development agency, you know, this is a very common thing. Things have this five-year life cycle. And then, you know, the development partner and the government moves on to the next exciting thing. Right. So, the, yeah, the challenge is stay exciting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next, next question. It's uh, for me, actually. Is there any gear you can't bring into Rwanda? Yeah, drones. <laughs> drones. <laughs> we had one i brought a phantom in i think that thing what did it sit in customs for like yeah. so a long for time not nine six to nine months because uh of security concerns you yeah. know not for the drone itself but you know they were very concerned about unlicensed use of them around the country yeah um and in fact i we've been i'm in my new house we i'm packing and i found a battery for that drone I don't have the drone anymore. The drone was stolen, <laughs> but I have a battery for so it. The, <laughs> <laughs> so that's what they're worried about. Someone would steal the drone and then use it. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you still have the yeah. battery. It took, yeah, six yeah. to nine months. How long did it last before it disappeared? I think it, not very long. No, I don't think. no, no, it was like six months or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Kevin, yeah. Kevin and I were experimenting with it just in our backyard, you know, flying it about 10 feet off the ground. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, we were we were particularly um, uh, we had to be especially careful because we we were a, a, a public institution. I, you know, we we even more than private citizens were expected to comply with the law. And yeah. so, so there were a lot of people. The frustrating part for us is there was a lot of people who were uh, just 
uh, using drones. You know, like they weren't asking anybody. They were just flying the drones around and, and we couldn't do that because we were yeah. expected to be at a higher higher level. Um, next higher question. standard. Higher standard, yeah. yeah. Ne- next question. Douglas Carmichael is back. I read an article that mentioned large electronic music events in Tanzania and Zanzibar. Considering that many vendors, example Roland, have territory restrictions on sales and focus mostly on North America, Europe, Asia, how could the gear make it there? Shipping containers <laughs> full of gear. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the, a lot of the events, I mean, Chris can expound on this, but a lot of the events in Kenya and Tanzania are, are big. You know, and a lot of the work stuff comes in from China. Um, but there is an enormous, I mean, you, you, they would have me- much of the same equipment. I remember we, we did the Transform Africa 2015, I think, and yeah. big, old, big old Yamaha CL5 and, you know, all the things that you would expect to have anywhere else. Um, I mean, you've got you've got places, especially in like in South Africa and Nairobi and, and I suspect probably in, in Nigeria where you can rent stuff. Um, and that's, there's certainly people who cater to the convention center in Kigali with giant, you know, LCD, LED, LCD yeah, LEDs, screens. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, and the way they get it there in the first place, I mean, there's only, there's air and sea and that's, and the air is really, really expensive and sea takes a really long time. So that's, so a lot of people set up, uh, rental, rental capacities. And there's a lot of LED walls. Like LED yeah. walls are a big deal in Africa. Like every event, like let's put up an LED wall. Way, way before we saw that happen in, here in the U.S., we saw it happen in Africa because uh, they're easier to maintain than they're, than the projectors. Um, next question. From Liberty White in Toronto, Ontario, what kinds of legalities do you need to keep in mind when planning a production that may be different than in North America? Um. I mean, you, in any country that you work in in Africa, you, you, are, you consider the sensitivities of the government at a higher level than you probably do in the United States. <laughs> like in the United States, you're kind of like, oh, we got, we got the First Amendment. Well, the First Amendment doesn't exist everywhere. And, and, uh, and you can, you know, you want to be kind of careful of, you know, putting yourself, I mean, and this is, again, again, probably every country that I'm in outside of the U.S., maybe Europe, but, I, you know, I'm conscious to... Um, what kind of content I'm building and whether I'm going to gather interest. One of the things in Zimbabwe, a lot of times I would, no matter, I never really, number one is I just told our folks, don't shoot things that look controversial. Like I don't, that's not why we're here. You know, like we're here, if we can empower everyone to shoot with video, somebody else will shoot that somewhere down the road, but it's not going to be us. You know, like we're just going to stick, you know, stay in our lane because, um, you know, if you cause trouble with one camera, you'll never get to two and but if you have a thousand it's, it's cats out of the bag <laughs> so, so just 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 stay stay in your stay in your lane um so we would always ca- i always had a video of uh folks in our b&b uh that were um serving us breakfast like a it was a very touristy video of them serving us breakfast and and i kept that in the camera all the time we traveled with that in the camera and even though i wasn't shooting anything controversial i never wanted to even look like it so we every once in a while you get a stop in Zimbabwe, they go, Hey, I need you to see I need to see the camera because you know, I'm Zungu. And Zungu is kind of the general term for white person. I think I think it's Swahili for wandering aimlessly, which is probably what we looked at yes, looked like yeah. when we got there. So so anyway, so the um uh so uh so you know, Zungu gets pulled over and you're like, Okay, I need to see the camera, you open it up and they see this like touristy video and they go, like, Okay, you can go. You know, and there wasn't any more. It it mostly just saved time, you know. Um and so um, but I think that, again, generally people go down there to pick fights, you know, about what they want to talk about. And I've, I just feel like I can make more difference. We now have all these people doing live streams all over Rwanda without taking hard stands on things that we didn't want to, that, you know, we, we're providing more of an opportunity by not, not getting into things that oftentimes are more complicated than they look on the surface. Go ahead, Chris. Um, just making sure the, the question was about challenges for filming here. Was that what kinds of legalities do you need to keep oh, legality? Mind? Okay. Legality oh, permits. I mean, this is an extension of what Alex was talking about. I mean, it's, you can't generalize in any way about Africa as a whole in terms of permits. Uh, there's a huge difference between Rwanda, say, and Morocco, where Morocco, from the king of on down, he wants movies to be made in, in his desert. And so it's really easy to get permits there. Rwanda would like movies to be made here, but the permit process, the Permits are spread across all these different institutions. If you want to film in this park, you have to go to this place. If you want to film 
anything political, yes, you have to go through the office of the president and talk to the ombudsman. If you want to, you know, film gorillas, you've got to go through the Rwanda Development Board. Um, it's a pain in the ass and um, and d- d- difficult, and consequently, not many movies have been made here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next question. Eduardo Augustine of Panama. Usually the average learning curve is about six months. Do these students excel even faster and more efficient due to the equipment and teaching methods you applied? I, I well, a lot of them were there longer than six months, and and I you know, and I think that, but I think that we they got through a lot of those things. I, I don't know what you learn in six months, but I think that what what our students learned over a couple of years was a lot, like more than I've seen anybody learn in in a traditional school. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, we started out with a two year program that. Um, encompassed a lot of different things from 3D to cinematography. Uh, since then, we've streamlined that and it's down to one year and we're getting this pretty much the same result, but with a narrow, slightly narrower focus in terms of subject. So like video production with Ryan, uh, it lasts for one year and they are entirely capable of taking the next step in their career, whether it's live streaming or you know filmmaking or whatever it is. And our our uh, success rate has been very high. I don't know what the number the numbers are in. Uh, I don't know how you define those numbers, but they've been pretty good. We lasted we lasted a tracer survey. Uh, now it's coming up. We need to do a new one four years ago, and we have a ninety percent employment rate in uh, amongst our graduates, which, especially in Rwanda, is significant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, next question: Rupert Trebek from Sydney, Australia. How was funding organized in these projects? Was it only government-based or were you able to use the studio space for commercial work to make it self-sufficient? Go ahead, Chris. A combination of both. Certainly the project couldn't have gotten started without very significant government support. Um, We probably, government probably invested around a million dollars in building out the studios and getting the equipment in the, in the early days. Since then, um, the the notion of having a production unit that works as a commercial entity is actually something that we did somewhat informally uh, along the way, which is now becoming a formal thing. Uh, And I'm not worth going into all the details and challenges there, but that's been something we're having to navigate inside approved government's procedures for the use of government purchased equipment. but yeah, we that's a specific goal is to support the school and a lot production. of and a lot of it is is that we're you know we're, we're in some ways we're putting ourselves out of a business because we're constantly training people that can do what we're doing you know what we're making those services um, for, but that is the goal. I mean, we're we try to get people on hands on work as fast as possible. We want to get them out of the classroom and into the field as as quickly as we can to make sure that they're they're really learning from doing it. Uh, next question. Lenny Nelson from San Antonio, Texas. What kind of professional career progression have your students had after completing your programs? Chris, do you want? Sure. Um, it's quite varied. Um, one of our graduates is probably the most successful director of music videos, and he's filmed in places ranging from Dubai to um, Cape Town. And, and he's you know really done. I mean, done far more than we ever taught him. Um, he's really done well. We he have, did well with all the equipment. Like he was constantly yeah, doing yeah. his music videos around the school. Yeah, he's was, was great. Yeah. Um, Cedric is an amazing guy. And then um, uh, you know, and then like there's a guy who just before COVID started, he um, he uh, got a scholarship to study continuous studies in Toronto. And now he's a big live streaming guy there. And um, the uh, I think a, a lot of what we've been successful at is giving people not always the, the explicit skills to do something, but rather the capacity to keep on developing their skills once they leave the school. Yeah, you can also um, see what a lot of them are doing at, at Facebook on ADMA Rwanda. Uh, and you can see the website is ADMA Rwanda as well. But if you go to Facebook, um, Ryan just posted that in the in the chat. Hi, Ryan. Uh, next question. From Hazma Gajar in Cape Town, South Africa. Rwanda Digital School appears to be successful and sustainable. What does it take to scale or replicate into additional countries? Governments on their own are not able to achieve on their own. You know, we've we've been committed to this for years. And we really look at wanting to build a 
Um, I, I, you know, for us, mostly we, we just, we're so busy keeping this one going that it hasn't, you know, there's been discussions about expanding it, um, across the continent. Um, I, you know, a, a lot of the ways I've thought about it is to build kind of a hub and spoke kind of thing where our school is, um, able to be a little bigger than what it is right now. We then have satellites that are, that that's how they start, um, in different countries. And then some of those satellites build up to, into their own hubs. And then you kind of, you know, we, we would love to get out where the, you could, there'd be four computers in a village somewhere and people are learning some of the basic stuff and watching some of the bits and pieces. And then, you know, eventually ending up in, in one of the larger, um, hubs. I mean, that's always been the goal. Um, but it, it you know, it's taken a long time to get to where we are. <laughs> we're still, we're happy to still be here. So I don't know if you want to add something, Chris. Yeah. Well, sure. I, um, I, we we wouldn't have been able to get the school off the ground without government support. I mean, in hindsight, sometimes you know, I wish oh, we tried to approach some foundations. But I think, you know, the big thing now is we have credibility in the sense that before we were saying we knew what to do, just mm-hmm. give us a chance, and now we've actually done it. And right. it would be interesting to reengage in some of those conversations mm-hmm. with you know the success that we've had. Yeah, and and look for private investment. The difficulty is, it's in the, on the private sector side is making it profitable, you know, right. or, or at least self sustaining is still significant. You can't. We still like if production plus tuition would still not cover our costs. Yeah, and and I think that and and I think that it does. I mean, when you look at the, you know, the, the one of the arguments that we made very early on was if we have a bunch of people that we're pumping out that are that are. Um, you know, making more money means they're paying more taxes. <laughs> so, they're, so, you know, there's a revenue for the government by putting, putting this in is, is from, a, you know, indirectly from that process. And I think that I, the one thing that we talk about a lot with governments and with organizations is that media ex- is an accelerator for everything around it. It's like, you know, so if it's, if you look at the live streams and the video production that our students do, it's empowering tourism, it's empowering government, it's empowering, um, you know, local businesses, it's empowering education, it's empowering all those things because it helps move all of those forward. It's not that it empowers one sector, it, it empowers lots of different sectors. And so um, it's definitely something, and that was the goal all you know from, from day one, it was to use it as an economic uh, stimulus for many, many sectors as opposed to just one sector. And so, so that was, you know, I think that we're definitely interested in it. We, you know, one of the hard parts I will admit that even the Rwanda government had a hard time with is that I'm, I'm very, uh, uh, resistant to, um, uh, to curriculum. <laughs> so, so I, I kind of feel like, you know, we should be dancing with what's necessary and figuring out what's there and, and building, having classes and building stuff, but building these long, like two, two year things, I was like, it's going to be obsolete by the time we get there, you know? And, and so there's been a lot of, you know, wanting to, you know, in our, and I think that until we, until we did the testing of the success of the school, I think that I, you know, I think that until we showed that a lot of our students were getting hired and, and being successful, I think that was, it was hard for them to get their head around that in the process. Cause a lot of people come out of academia and they're kind of um, limited in their view of how people learn. Um, I know that sounds crazy, but academia is kind of a hard place for people to learn how to teach. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, or for when people, when you're actually teaching skills and you're actually going, okay, I'm going to have these people, I don't need them to be theoretically smart. I need them to actually be able to execute something is, is a different, is a different puzzle. You're going to say something, Chris. I just, one of the rewarding things is, um, in a sense, we've, the example that we set is now sort of percolating into education in different ways. Um, so ADMA is part of a larger institution called Rwanda Polytechnic. And the vice chancellor of Rwanda Polytechnic has stopped by our classes a couple of times. And, and on both occasions, like, this is what cl- all classes, all of our vocational classes should be like. Right. You know, how can we do this? And um, um, some stuff to pass on to you, Alex, later. But, yeah. yeah. So, you know, and, and again, I think that, that we're, we're hope when COVID hit our students in the school were just deep in video production, you know, like how do we turn all, how do we get all these classes, you know, online? And I think that that's where we want to keep on moving forward with what we're doing. Uh, yeah. Next question. Al Trevet in Carmichael, California. What kind of opportunities do the students have after they graduate? Go ahead, Chris. Well, um, I mean, it's it's the regular array 
of, you know, there's a number of TV, you know, the obvious ones are television stations you know, and, and studios are here. Everybody's getting into music. So there's lots of opportunities around the music industry. Um, emerging ones are sports broadcasting is something I'm trying to sort of get a better understanding of because yeah. there's, there's a big jump in organized uh, athletic leagues here for cricket and basketball and things like that. Um, we're looking at wildlife filmmaking um, because that's uh, something that's very interested you know, and very uh, appealing to, to people. And another one that I'm really pushing on is actually video production for e-learning. Yeah. because that's uh, something that's really emerging, uh, particularly around the notion that um, schools and universities in Africa would rather have content that reflects, that reflects the, their, their, their faculty, their students, you know, homegrown content rather than um, packaged content from the West. Yeah, absolutely. And in local language in some cases. Uh, so that, you know, especially when you start talking about um, the O levels, you know, out in the rural areas, you really need to still be able to do it in Kenawanda. Uh, next question. Hasma Kajar from Cape Town, South Africa. With the ubiquitous presence of mobile devices, what digital or AV literacy or skill development should be considered with the mobile device as the only internet connected device in most of Africa? Well, in some ways, you know, Rwanda has more of this than a lot of other countries um, as far as that goes. I think that, and we've done some, uh, you know, I think that, uh, I don't know about the, the skill development has been in a lot of different sectors, but we've done some education stuff that's really designed for that sector or at least for broadcast, right, Chris? Yeah. I, I've actually been getting more and more involved with digital education in Rwanda. And one of the things that gets talked about a lot is, you know, de delivery via smartphone. And the aid agencies are all in the you know, targeting smartphones as, as the way to distribute, uh, you know, educational content. The problem there is the cost of data. Um, and then also the actual quality of the smartphone. Everybody's got phones, but there are these smartphones that cost the equivalent of about $60 um from china or something like that and the penetration as you move away from the cities gets drops dramatically um so then you're also having to figure out you know who's my target audience and is the smartphone assumption really relevant for them as we develop uh i i co-wrote actually the the formal government policy on e-learning uh for rwanda <clears throat> and we've actually moved away from smartphones and uh, focusing more on creating uh, sort of academic versions of cyber cafes. Yeah, I can go into a lot more detail, but that's <laughs> do another, we'll do another <laughs> second hour. We'll talk yeah. about that. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think that that's the thing that we found is that being able to provide a centralized location because the government, the one thing that, that they, we do have is fiber, you know, so there's fiber in a lot of the country. The problem is, is that it's so ubiquitous that oftentimes the, the service by the time it gets to the end, end person is low because they, they made it very inexpensive to use, you know, and so um, so it's, it, it, it's a little bit difficult, but the government still has some of those pipes. And so being able to have like that cyber cafe, as Chris talked about, also radio and TV are important because a lot of people have them, you know, and it's, you're not paying for data to, to distribute, you know, for people to listen to a radio station or watch a TV um, show. So there's other play, other ways to distribute that, that knowledge out as well. Next question. Douglas Carmichael is back. Have you ever thought of partnering with local musicians to teach them electronic music production techniques and market their music? I could see this having both positive cultural and economic effects if you do it right. I have to say that a lot of the there's a lot of artists in, in, in Rwanda that already know how to use the tools. Yeah. <laughs> so hey, there's nothing I, I can teach them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in in really Kigali good. anyway, yeah. You know, the ones that want to do electronic music, there's there's some great schools actually in Kigali for for this kind of this kind of right. stuff. Go ahead, Chris. No, there is a, a specific music school. And honestly, you know, there's enough technology available. Um, and you know how young people are with that. They've uh, they've run with it as far as they can. They know how to uh, squeeze every last drop out of what they have available. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, nothing for us to offer there. Yeah. No, next question. Al Trevet from Carmichael, California. What are the greatest misconceptions about working in Africa? I would say 
that the greatest one is that everyone thinks that it's really dangerous and it's, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that, it, that you don't have to pay attention, but I don't find it to be any, I don't find, well, especially Rwanda, I definitely don't find it to be any more threatening than <laughs> New York City, <laughs> you know, so, so, uh, or lots of, lots of parts of LA and definitely San Francisco. So, so I don't, I don't think that, um, I think that the big thing that everyone has is that it's all dirt floors, that it's all, um, you know, it's dangerous and that there's, you know, every, every time you come back, you know, um, I would have said, and yet you've got malaria, but both Chris and I have had malaria. <laughs> so, so, so you will, you might get that. So, so anyway, um, but the, uh, Chris's version of it was way worse than mine. Um, uh, mine was a couple of days and Chris lost what, 30% of your weight, right? And it was, yeah. So, so the, um, and so anyway, the, uh, um, uh, the, but I, I would say that, that, that people just don't understand you know, like that it really is just like everything else when what they report, what you get reported is all just the bad news. And there's just so much good news. I mean, it's such a great place to be. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. I just, <clears throat> you know, one of the things, and this was for me as well, even though I was familiar with Africa is the, the Mercator projection uh, distorts our perception of just how big Africa is. Yeah. And we're talking about an area that's three times the size of the continental United States. It's, it's, it's a mistake to homogenize the African experience because yeah. what you get in South Africa is vastly different from what you get in Nigeria or Egypt. Um, but just to reinforce. Oh, lost Chris there for a second. But to keep on while, while Chris is, we'll see what happens there. there. But uh, um, we pushed it just a little too far. I was going, his connection is working so well. Um, anyway, the, uh, uh, yeah, I think that, as Chris was talking about, that it it is every African country is very different. So saying that I am uh, that it's like Africa, it is you know every country is very very different and more different in in many ways than even um, you know every country is is more different than most countries in like Europe from each other or from whatever because they're. There's not a lot, there hasn't been a lot of, you know, travel and so on and so forth, but it's also very Westernized in some cases because a lot of people watch Western, Western 80s TV shows because they're cheap to put on air. You see a lot of that. Uh, go ahead, John. Alex, what was the name of that misconception of how big Africa was? He said a name and I... Yeah, missed. it's the Mercator projection. Okay. So if you, if you, if you look at, there is, um, you know, proper scaling for Africa, in, in, but it's a, the Mercator projection, the way it distorts it, it makes things because it's it's kind of shooting an angle from a plane onto the earth. And what that means is things at the top and bottom of the earth look really big and things in the center looks much smaller in relationship to those. If you look at the at the um, uh, at the latitude uh, lines that are that are going up on a on a Mercator projection, a typical map, you'll notice that they get further apart as it goes up. That means it's taking that and stretching it out. Um, you know, as opposed to just having it. So when you compact that back, you get a more accurate view of how big countries are in relation to them. Like, you know, the Soviet Union is not nearly as large as it looks. Greenland is not nearly as large as it looks. Um, and Africa is a lot bigger than it looks. Go ahead. You, you were, uh, we, we, you got interrupted, Chris, there by a short dropout. Yep. I, I had to switch routers. <laughs> <laughs> <There you> um, <laughs> um, yeah. If you just Google um, Africa map, uh, Greenland or something like that, you'll find somewhere, you'll find a, a really fun illustration of just like, you know, like Greenland fits inside the Congo in terms of yeah. square miles. Yeah. But if you look at the Mercator projection, it looks like it's close to the same size. And, and you right. can find other kind of fun maps that illustrate, you know, yeah. how perception has been, is, yeah. is incorrect. And, I, and then I just, I just have to say that I'm always amazed. People get scared away from Africa for whatever reason. And it's just such an amazing, like in, in many, in every city that I've been in, I've had kind of a magic, I mean, every country that I've been in. I've had some magical experience there that was just something that I don't think I could have uh, anywhere else in the world. Um, yeah. Next question. Oh, you're going to say one more thing, Chris? Oh, just, you know, the, and this, this perception of Africa is extremely common. Uh, friends back home who are very well educated seem to think I have zebras walking through my backyard or something <laughs> like that, you know, and it's, it's and very, it's very civilized. Yeah. Only, only in that, only in the summer. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, so that, yeah, so, <laughs> you know, and, and I think that again, as someone who works in Africa, you have a hard time reading like things like the economist are hard to read. If you're the, the, the African section, the economist, I always like, I like, I read the economist a lot or listen to it now. And there's a lot of me rolling my eyes like, Oh, right. <laughs> That's such an English thing to say. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, there's a lot of post-colonial uh, uh, arrogance that, that gets kind of 
um, washed across the continent that doesn't help it. Um, next, well, and as question. far as distortions are concerned, I was in college before I saw a map that was like even close to accurate. It's kind of yeah. nuts. <laughs> a story I'm not going to put on YouTube about that. Next question. Douglas Carmichael, how do you connect ADMA graduates to employers that want to hire them? Do you target employees or employers in Africa or farther afield? I don't. Do we target um, anyone other than they're, 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 no, they're, all, no. they're all causing trouble and people? I, they're, 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 it's just the place to go yeah. to get them. No, I mean we we have the benefit now of some longevity. Where um, when and I'm saying this with I'm trying with as little arrogance as possible. <laughs> um, we we have a good enough reputation that uh, just if, when employers hear that somebody has an ADMA certificate, they. Um, you know, they are already treated favorably. Yeah. I little quick little story. I, I wandered into an elevator for a company called, I, I it must be big because they own a whole building in Kigali called Infinix. And this guy said, oh, you don't remember me. I graduated from a few years ago. And I was like, oh, what are you doing here? I said, well, nothing to do with multimedia. But when they heard I went to ADMA, they figured out oh, I can learn something. And <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's great. Uh, next question. J.J. McKenna in Santa Venetia, California, asked, given that outsourced talent has become more ubiquitous, Master Mickey is our audio king, would it not make sense to hopefully market some of these student abilities in our organization? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, one of the reasons that we really, and we haven't, we, we've mostly focused on video recently, and so that's more of a local production market solution, whereas... Uh, you know, some of the computer graphics and 3D and everything else was designed to give the students access to larger markets that are outside of Rwanda and then have them build those skill sets up. And we're still committed to doing those kinds of things. I think that um, AR and, and VR and 3D provides a lot of opportunity for people all over the world. Um, but I think that, you know, what's been successful as far as what's happening today has been mostly local market development. Um, Chris? I just you know we 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 experimented with that um we did uh work for a while on doing things like cleaning up mocap data um but it was it, there was all kinds of reasons why it was harder than it looked to make it work efficiently um yeah. and it would take me too long to get into all the details but yeah yeah next question Looks like the last question. It's from Douglas Carmichael. Did you ever run into issues using local labor that has not dealt with the needs of complex production before? How did you mitigate those issues? Well, I think that when we started, there was a lot of challenges with students. Just students hadn't hadn't done this before. Um, the uh, and and it was just a matter. Of, what I learned in in Rwanda is that if you have people that are willing to listen and you have one or two people that know what they're doing, you can build a pretty good team pretty quickly you know, to do video production. And so, you know, we had the, stu the students were attentive, ready to, to do what ne is needed to be done. And then myself and Chris and, and Ryan and a couple other folks would be down there telling them, okay, like literally it'd be like, I know you haven't used a camera before. You're just gonna have to, here's the camera. I'm gonna tell you what to do. I'm telling you what not to do. I'm gonna, you know, just kind of, you know, and you're gonna have to figure this out. And a lot of times, if you have that expert there that's willing to poke at things, to push the quality, again, Chris was talking about that earlier, like going, hey, that doesn't really look right, or, you know, we should be framed up closer. Like a lot of things that we, that, that I think that we brought to it were um, the, you know, we demanded framing that was closer. Like our lenses aren't that long, so you have to put us in the middle of the room instead of the back of the room. Our, you know, we want this kind of framing. We want this kind of lighting. We want this much time. You know, that was a big thing is like, we wanted way more time to load in than what people are used to. And so, so, and that all tightened, the, and then that became the thing because well, the quality is working. And so people start to, you know, fall into place of that's what needs to happen to make that work. You're gonna say, Chris? The MO here <clears throat> with a client is usually them telling you what to do. And so us turning that, uh, reversing that, we're telling them what to do was a new thing when we got started here. And that comes from trust, you know, like when you yeah. start succeeding, they're like, okay, how do you do, how are you doing what you're doing that no one else yeah. is doing? And, and, um, but it is, it's still, uh, I still remember like the thing about Africa that, that I, that I didn't fully grip until I was there was the power of immense labor, like the, that you can throw enormous numbers of people at something, something and make something just turn. So what I mean by that is we walked in, we were in the Serena and there was one day where, where, uh, it was like an hour before the event and the stage was 
on one wall and all the seats were set up and someone came in and said, no, 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 it was supposed to be on that wall. And I looked at it like, well, they're not going <laughs> to, too bad for them. And uh, sure enough, you know, like 400 people showed up and in, in 20 minutes, the whole room had been turned, you know, and we had to like pull up all the, you know, pull up all the tape and run our cameras all over the place. And you just realize that things can happen very quickly. So, so I think for us, it was also learning what's possible, you know, that, that you can, um, that things can happen much faster than you expect, you know, um, and, and people can get things done very quickly. You're going to add something, Chris? No, just, I mean, and, and that's cross cutting, building my house. We never had a backhoe, everything, the foundation, everything, the septic tank dug by hand yeah. uh, because it's cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, um, so anyway, it was very interesting. Anyway, that's, so Chris, thanks for coming in from all the way from Rwanda. Thanks. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. I hope it was helpful. I didn't give Chris a lot of warning. I think it was earlier this week. I was like, hey, I'm doing this thing. Hopefully you guys can, hopefully you guys can come. <laughs> so it was really great. And we're, uh, we'll, get, we'll get another opportunity to have Chris, uh, uh, Ryan on um, to talk about some of the stuff. And hopefully as the, as the new, we, we're in a new location. And as that new location shores up a little bit, um, we're hoping to bring the students in more often and get them more involved with what we're working on. So, so stay tuned. Uh, stay tuned for that. And so anyway, so thanks for listening to me uh, batter on about one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> so uh, in, the, in the world, uh, right, right, uh, right around, you know, there's office hours in Africa and they're, they're, they're neck and neck for my two favorite things to talk about. So, uh, so anyway, um, so thanks, thanks for listening. And thanks to the uh, producers for all the great questions. It was, it was a good conversation. And uh, thanks to the panel. We can't do this without you. And thanks to the incredible crew on the back end producing this every single day, seven days a week. And thanks again to Chris for coming in. Yeah. It's good to, good to see you, Chris. And um, now we're going to go ahead and jump into After Hours. I think if Alex got eaten by a lion that, that we'd lose office hours. No, no. Mitch would have to take over. Yeah, yeah it's all to... fun until the baboon steals your big gulp. Baboons really aren't fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a baboon. He just he walked up. Baboons have work. serious canines. I mean, really big. You know, they ah, and they got these really big. The, the video I missed. The video I missed was was the um, the baboon walked over to me and just like he looked at. He was a, right in Cape Town and he was like he looked at my sandwich and he looked at me and he looked at my sandwich and then he just reached out like like a little human and just reached out and took my sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>